Welcome to start session three, the first of the two afternoon sessions. We're having a panel discussion about seaweed and genetics, which is a week-long conference in itself. Um, but our wonderful moderator, uh, Tom Mumford, and two scientists, um, Katie and Simona and Tom are going to have a great conversation. And there will be time for questions. Same format as before. Yep. You all quiet down really beautifully. Thank you for doing that. Because they did that, we're going to do mic checks. OK, and I guess we're going to make sure the mics work. That's useful. Go ahead. Can you all hear me in the back? Can anyone hear me? Yep. Yeah. All right, Terrific. does this one work? Are we good? Tom, I'd rather have you introduce yourself than me do it. OK. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Tom Mumford. Tom Mumford. You got everything? All right. Hi, everybody. This is an amazing occurrence for me. Um, I probably know about half the people or more in this room, which is kind of remarkable in, in some ways. Anyway, it's good to be here. Uh, I'm Tom Mumford. Just to put, I'm not going to do a long introduction, but just to say I was hired by the Department of Natural Resources in 1976 to start a seaweed aquaculture industry in the state of Washington. And, and as they say, the rest is history. Um, so I've, I've got a little track record here, but I'm here today just to moderate these two folks here. Um, so let me go, if is this is going to work. They're working for you back there, Terry. I just was commenting, how many of these kind of shows have I been in that just devolve into a mess, technically? And so far, we're doing just great. Anyway. Just jinxed us, <laughs> I just jinxed you what? Just jinxed us? What happened? <laughs> it hasn't happened yet. At any rate, um, so yeah, again, this discussion is about genetics, and I added diseases because they're kind of intertwined in many ways here. And we've got two folks to come help about this. But I just wanted to say that these are two intertwined topics. They're, they're, not, they're not separate at all. And there's a great interest in, in the genetics uh, not only in seaweed aquaculture, but just aquaculture in general. And I will expand that to say agriculture uh, in general, that the development of an interaction of these organisms and the genetics of these things are of huge importance. Um, the relationships uh, between the wild stock, we've already alluded to this, and population stocks, introduced species, uh, you got gene flow between all these different um, types of organisms. Really important kind of stuff here. Uh, from a practical standpoint, you get into sort of species selection, strain selection, stock source availability. All these kinds of issues are things that we'll talk about here today. Um, and the diseases, uh, likewise, uh, I always had the quote, nature abhors a monoculture. As soon as you start growing a lot of one thing, there's going to be something that's going to take advantage of it. How do you prevent that? How do you control that will be a topic of some of the discussion today here. So the format, basically what I want to do here is uh, talk, talk a little bit about um, these two topics here. Keep in mind the kind of outline that um, Meg outlined this morning. We're here to coordinate, cooperate, learn how to move forward. This is a, in, in a positive way with all this kind of con, uh, discussion here today. Uh, so e each speaker is going to just say a few things about themselves here. And then I've got a list of sort of pre-arranged questions that we can go through as we see fit. And then at the end, we'll open it up to questions from the, or not at the end, but at some point, we'll open it up to discussion and questions from the audience, the participants here. And then I'll try to make some kind of a summary statement if I have my wits together at the end of all this. OK? So um, I'm the moderator, and Kate and Simona here. Um, so. Simona, you want to get up and do this, or shall I? It looks like you've got a. You, I can, yeah, I can. You, you, you've got a. This is a attitude thing. Yes. All right. Well, uh, my name is Simona Ogite, and I just want to say thank you so much for Meg, Terry, Nicole for putting this together. It's really good to see everybody come together, various stakeholders, and, and talk about this. Um, so I just wanted to share a little bit of my own phycological journey. And um, it all started, so I was at Cal Poly Humboldt doing my undergraduate work. And then I went on to do a master's with Frank Shaughnessy, where I looked at basically the marine flora between Cape Mendocino 
and Cape Blanco. And so we were interested in just figuring out what diversity was out there in between the two capes and if there was uh, differences at the capes where there was a lot of wave exposure. And we also wanted to kind of compile this with historical records to just have a baseline of information. And it was at this time that I went to a, a, a seaweed conference and I actually talked to Bob Walland um, from UW and I, I said, hey, I want to do seaweed aquaculture. What do you recommend? And he said, there's this awesome person called Charlie Yarish and he's on the East Coast. And so I reached out to him and I ended up working with him for my PhD. And um, coming from the West Coast to the East Coast, um, I found that there was low um, kelp diversity specifically. Um, so, uh, you know, there's a lot of sugar kelp, but basically where we were um, in Long Island Sound, the, there's, it's the, it gets really warm in the summertime, so it's kind of like the southernmost boundary for sugar kelp. So I went up north more and worked with this. Uh, it was considered a forma of sugar kelp, but based on some genetic evidence, we showed that it, this is actually a different species. So this is Saccharina angustissima, and we work to kind of elevate it to that species level um, using genetics, but also we were the first to domesticate this species. And so now there's a lot of seaweed farmers in the area that are growing this uh, cultivar. And they, they found that it's, uh, it, it's high yielding and it responds well to any kind of disease outbreak. So it's, it's very resilient, um, which has been really exciting. And again, this was done at University of Connecticut. Um, I, had a I worked in industry after I graduated for, for a short period of time, and then I went on to do a postdoc at UConn, and that was with uh, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, and that was funded by Department of Energy Mariner Program to do seaweed farming offshore, but the emphasis there was doing uh, kelp breeding, so developing cultivars and moving away from collecting wild stock, but developing cultivars in the lab and you know holding on to those gametophytes, making crosses, and then looking at the lines. So looking at um, genotyping and phenotyping. So looking at, you know, if you have a parent that looks like this and a parent that looks like this, you put them together, what's the offspring gonna look like? And is that gonna, uh, you know, how does that, in subsequent generations, um, do you have the same traits expressed? So those folks are still doing that work, um, and it's it's super important. Another thing that we also did while I um, while I was out there is looking at the population genetics of sugar kelp in the region. So again, uh, it has the southern limit around Long Island, but then. Um, we saw that there was actually a genetic break at Cape Cod. So the, the populations in the south were, you know, genetically different than what was found in the north. So to be conservative, we recommended that you wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't cross those two populations. So you would stick with the populations in the south and then you'd stick with the populations in the north. Um, but then I figured uh, I wanted a little bit more sunshine, so uh, <laughs> I moved out uh, to Kona, so I'm currently uh, residing in Hawaii uh, on the Big Island, and I work at Nelha for a company called Ocean Era, so I'm the lead scientist there, um, focused on macroalgae cultivation, and we are primarily also funded by Department of Energy, who are interested in cultivating seaweed for biofuels, food, and feed. And for now, we're doing all, all the work on land, but the hope is to go offshore. And the biggest challenge in working in the tropics is that the water is oligotrophic, so it's very low nutrients. And uh, but the upside is that we have plenty of sunshine and we can cultivate year round. So. So there's those things. And we are focused on cultivating different species. We have a couple reds, a couple greens, uh, and 
no kelp whatsoever. So, um, so there is that. And on top of that, as a side project, I just want to put in a plug. I also uh, co-founded the California Seaweed Festival with a colleague of mine that was also um, initially started with Sea Grant funds. But we also basically wanted to build a social license in California because there is a lot of interest both in seaweed farming, but also in just um, you know celebrating the diversity and celebrating the uh, ecosystem services that uh, seaweeds provide. And so we were putting, to, this is our third year, we had um, the festival where we, pr we wanted to bring people together to, from different disciplines. So both scientists, entrepreneurs, and uh, artists to, to kind of start talking and to see where there's an intersection in, uh, in the seaweed world. So, so there's my plug, thank you. <laughs> Hi everyone, uh, I'm Katie Davis, I use she, her pronouns, and I am the lead biologist with the Washington State Department of Fish and Wildlife in the new shellfish and seaweed health and biosecurity unit, and so this is a newly funded and newly established or broadening program within the WDFW. And just to give you some of my background, so I came to DFW from a postdoc that was funded by the Hakai Institute and the University of British Columbia working on sea star wasting disease out at the USGS lab on Maristone. And so thinking about sort of marine diseases and what causes them and how they spread and another important a keystone predator that can impact kelp. Um, and then for my PhD, which I did at the University of British Columbia, I studied the microbial communities that are on cultivated kelp, so kind of working towards some of this baseline knowledge to understand what, what healthy microbes are on cultivated kelp. And I also did some work on other intertidal algae and shellfish. Um, and so that's sampling the microbiome of cultivated kelp. And then before that, I got to work on some projects with the Port Gamble Sklalem tribe, and I was a farmer and research technician for the Organic Seed Alliance on the Olympic Peninsula, and sort of working in the stewardship of organic seed and farming practices and on-farm uh, selection and breeding, so sort of the terrestrial agriculture side of some of the topics that we're discussing now for kelp um, and sort of thinking about local and regionally adapted varieties and how and varieties best suited for sustainable practices. Um, so yeah, that's some of my background and I'm really excited to be chatting with these experts and participate in the discussion with all of you. Great. <clears throat> A lot of depth here, folks. <laughs> take, let's take advantage of this. So what uh, we had done was to come up with a list of, of sort of starting point questions for you two. And you, you can have a hard time seeing this, I suspect. Good. You're good? good? We know you're good. But <laughs> Anyway, so these are some of the questions that we kind of came up with. And I, I asked these two just to kind of answer, ad lib their way through these things. Some of these are going to be relevant and others and the give and take. So such things is for both genetics and diseases, you know, what are your main concerns? Um, what is the scientific basis for these concerns? In other words, is there something you can actually talk about? Um, what science may be needed to further focus these concerns? And I, I'm saying, in, I'm taking, for example, like, you know, we're worried about genetics. Well, what about genetics? And, and what part of that is of concern? And then how can we answer or what do we know and what can we do to get a better answer for that thing? A lot of, about what's known elsewhere. Uh, I think we've had all, we've all been down this path. There's a lot, particularly in these areas, that have been done in places like Korea and China uh, and in Europe to, to some degree. Uh, and then how do the Washington regulations either address or not address these? And Katie, you're going to answer some of this. I think later on, Chris Adler is going to be here, or is here, and maybe could help answer some of these as well. Um, what kind of short-term solutions might we have? What kind of BMPs might we start off with? 
And then, as we talked about, I think Emily and, and Meg both have put out very well, how do we move forward? What's the sort of cycle of, of adaptive management and, and moving forward and doing research and getting the answers and, and coming up with better, better BMPs, better, better practices? So with that, we've got a fair amount of time here. So let's just start down the road. Anybody want to start off number one here? And we'll start with genetics. Let's, let's start with genetics. Got a microphone there? Or you can come up here if you want. If you want to come up here and talk, you can see no, the, the bouncy I'm mark. okay to just sit, <laughs> sit and talk. <laughs> um, well, the first thing I just want to say is um, I think diversification is super important. I think um, I've seen a lot of interest here um, in just focusing on kelp. And kelp is fantastic, but I, I do think that um, there's an opportunity to think about other species as well, and maybe even you know having a summer crop to diversify or you know intermix into your winter crop, just so you have you have the habitat there. You know if you have your lines, I, it depends on the permitting too. Um, if you can keep your lines in the water all summer long, you might think about putting in another species that you know could also um, grow there. And then thinking about genetic diversity also, so definitely want to consider species that are native to your region and developing cultivars that are specific to your location. And I think this can become a problem though with climate change and range retreats, right? So that's something that will need to be addressed, but you know, working within your region I think is obviously super important. You don't wanna import stuff from maybe Southern California or something like that if you don't need to, so start with that. Yeah, and that's a, a good segue and I'll put on my DFW hat and just uh, share the mission of the agency, which is to preserve, protect, and perpetuate fish, wildlife, and ecosystems while providing sustainable fish and wildlife recreational and commercial opportunities. And so our regulatory responsibilities are more in the prevention and management of pests and diseases and non-native species. Um, but of course, with that comes preserving biodiversity and genetic resources because loss of that can really increase susceptibility to disease. Um, and so again, thinking about uh, what, what biodiversity exists, what seaweeds are out there, and, and then the genetic variation within species and, and the population connectivity, so how gene flow is happening in the wild. Um, and that can be useful in informing sort of management, like Simona said, thinking about how seed stock gets moved, transferred within the state or where it's being sourced from to be um, using sustainable best practices. Um, yeah, and then again, thinking about also best practices for restoration and producing seed stock or things like biobanks like PSRF is working on and how we best manage those to, to really um, maintain genetic diversity. Tom, would you like to add to that? Oh, I, I, you know, this is your... So I... I <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll just ask a question. So the question is, like on the, on the genetic biodiversity kind of things, what concrete things um, could we be doing the short term and long term, and what do you think the concerns are about if we don't do these things? It, we, we're still kind of thinking at a fairly high level here. Um, so if we're not working towards preserving genetic diversity, is that... What are the concerns? Yeah. So I guess we can draw from examples. So we're in a really unique position to draw from examples from other countries and other states. 
and thinking about um, places where maybe seaweed cultivation has moved forward without some of these considerations that we're discussing. And so in places like Chile, where like with agara fights, there's been a real a strong reduction in genetic diversity because of the propagation methods or how they're sourcing their genetic material. And so that leads to all sorts of issues with disease and pests. And so I think that's a major concern. Yeah, and obviously, um, you know, not native species introduction is is a huge issue. So, uh, you know, working with with native populations is is critical. And obviously, you can leverage the the population genetics work that has been done for bull kelp in the area. Um, so, and 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 potentially work with additional genetic work. So, if if there is a lot of interest in you know, maybe doing sugar kelp here, then working with scientists to get the population genetics analyzed and then seeing, um, you know, is it okay to sample from different locations or would you pick just one location because otherwise it's, it's all the same. Um, so I think that's important to think about, but there there's a lot to do also in terms of like cultivars. Um, and if you are to develop a seed stock, you know, there's, um, you know, people have bred sugar kelp to, pr to be disease resistant and, to, or, you know, to be disease resistant and, and to be high yielding. So if that is a goal, if, if we want to grow um, disease resistant kelp, you know, that is something to think about as well and how to do that sustainably and have a seed bank that from that region and then you, cultivate your, your seaweed. Um, so I think there's a lot of potential there. I was curious this morning, the comment was made somewhere about Maine, and they haven't developed warm temperature resistant uh, cultivars. And I think this definitely blends over into the restoration business, because I, I think we're going to end up having uh, issues with uh, global warming here. We already, we already have, I think. And so, but Maine said you can't use those. And so how does that play into what we're doing here? Is this something that we would want to do the same kind of a thing, or do you think we should move forward and be thinking about using those kind of cultivars? Yeah, and that's, you know, that's an ethical issue. I know in um, Australia they've had huge kelp die-offs, and they are doing some uh, restoration work bringing them from other regions just so that there is that habitat and, and that habitat, you know, is there for, for the organisms and everybody else that needs those ecosystem services. So that's something to think about is, you know, bringing species from the south. But that's only if you need it, right? So if the species are tolerant, then just work with what you have for now. Yeah, and I'll just add that I think the, in moving forward with something like that, one of the needs that we have is just a better understanding of what the existing diversity is and in across species. And, and also the, one of the big questions is, is how does gene, how does genetic diversity move between cultivated seaweeds and wild populations. And so we want to ideally prevent that from happening because that's a, a way to lose genetic diversity. Um, and so uh, I think just thinking about developing more of those baselines will be really important moving forward. Um, so another example that we've got is, uh, as I understand it, in the state of Alaska, that the seed stock, one, has to be collected within 50 miles, is it? Somebody here may know more about this than I do, probably do. And that every year you have to use new material. In other words, you can't 
overwinter or keep a seed stock from previous things. Uh, again, this is, a, it would seem to be a fairly precautionary. 50 kilometers? 50 kilometers? Yeah. Miles, kilometers, yeah. <laughs> um, that's 30 miles, right? <laughs> um, so anyway, that, that's another approach that's been taken by another, another local state here. And I, what are your thoughts about that? I think, yeah, if, I mean, it works for Alaska, but Alaska is very different. They have a lot of coastline and they have a lot of space to do um, large scale cultivation. So uh, I think it's different. Another, another thing I just wanted to bring up is also um, the work that has been done on cultivars in Korea, for example, where they, um, they're basically growing abalone and then to feed the abalone, they're growing kelp. And so what I had a chance to go out and visit and um, you know, they're basically just growing the, the kelp right next to the abalone. But what they, the, the issue they had was that in the summer months, the abalone didn't have enough food because the kelp would you know, die off and the temperatures got too warm. So they were able to develop cultivars that they selected that were able to withstand warmer temperatures. And that way they were able to extend the food for their cultivated abalone. So there, there are ways to address these uh, cultivar issues and the warming temperatures using some epigenetics. So basically just selecting for strains or even um, exposing strains to different lab conditions that will make them more resilient to warmer temperatures. And I'll go back to thinking, thinking more about the standing local genetic variation and how that allows some capacity for adaptation to local conditions. And so one of the things that we're thinking about similar to that 50 kilometer rule, and we don't have any hard and fast rules yet, but something that we're thinking about is how we manage marine regions for growing kelp to maintain that local adaptive potential. Um, and then thinking you know, for areas where there may have been dramatic losses of kelp and you no longer have that wild stock available for seed production, then maybe moving towards some type of selective technique. But there are, are methods that can be used that try and broaden the genetic pool. So there's a lot of different techniques for selective like selective breeding or hybridization that could be consi considered moving forward and maybe you have some experience with <laughs> different. That's good, yeah. I, and I know uh, also in addition, the, the folks at Woods Hole um, who I used to work with um, and also Yukon, so Scott Lindell and Charlie Arish, they are working on a project to, uh, to, to breed um, basically a, a strain of kelp that is infertile, infertile. So basically selecting a strain that, if, it, if there is a concern that you know, your strain would get out into the wild, um, they are looking for these genetic mutations and then you know, selecting for that. So um, that's just another, yeah, another way to address the research. Another topic that, that I've dealt with in Mia culpa, um, introduced species, and I think we mentioned this before, and I personally um, am dealing right now with a whole bunch of very odd seaweeds from Japan, places like Quilcene, Debob Bay, and so forth, and, and, there, and Sargassum is another one. It really, in my personal opinion, I want to really try to avoid introduced species. I had the nori business going here. I had Japanese species here. I would never, ever do that again. I would, it was a huge mistake on my part, mea culpa. Um, but don't, I, I wouldn't say don't, don't go there. You know, and we probably don't need to, uh, to be really honest. Um, we've got diversity here and, and things we can play with uh, very much. Another thing I just wanted to mention in passing here was the, the whole idea, and, and Betsy, you're involved with this a little bit. We're losing kelp, bull kelp in particular, and there's some slides about it. 
losing this kelp in Puget Sound, the efforts to basically biobank or cryopreserve some of these, these genetic uh, stocks so they don't get lost forever. Squaxin Island is about to disappear. We've got, uh, I've got, been working on just how do you get gametophytes and get them in culture and get them in as many different places as you can, just Noah's Ark, almost kind of, a, of an approach to thing. So we, in the future, we'll have that genetic diversity at our, to be able to use for restoration and possible cultivation. Should we have questions from folks? Is that ready to go? Okay, so um, the uh, microphones are open. I would please ask, I've been reminded, if you have a question, either come bring them up by cards or to the speaker. Don't do like I did and sit in the audience this morning because nobody can hear you, okay? <laughs> so have at it. <clears throat> Hi, uh, my name is Jennifer Clark. I'm from Cascadia Seaweeds in Canada, BC. Hi, Jennifer. <laughs> Good to see you here. Yeah. <laughs> Another one of these old Nori people here. <laughs> I've, I've moved to Kelp now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now you've moved on. <laughs> um, I mean, there's obviously a lot of crossover between BC and, and Washington State as well. Um, and, you know, one of our biggest things is like where to collect parent material. You know, how far 50 kilometers is what we are doing currently because there's so much not known about that in BC. I'm wondering what, if you know, what the current like status of the genetic connectivity is in some of the more um, cultured and like uh, Saccharina, Alaria, um, Macrocystis, and Nereo. Um, Saccharina and Alaria being a very common seaweed to, to grow. I'm wondering if you know what the status of like genetic, genetic connectivity and diversity, or is that still being determined? I have a second question to you, Miller. <laughs> I will, I think maybe the best way to answer that is Betsy and or Brian, will you work with Felipe? But no, we, the only thing I think we know anything about, I think the only thing we really know much about is, is, is Neriocystis, right? Brian, can you come up to Mikey? Yeah, the answer is we know actually not a lot, but we, we, know, we do know something. I was making my tea. I wasn't paying entirely attention to the question. What was <laughs> Genetic connectivity of different species of kelp. That's commonly kelp cultivated. C commonly, yeah. yeah. So Bull kelp, sugar kelp, yeah. these kind of things here. What's the question? <laughs> Sorry. Do we know what the status is? Like, is there literature or research that's been done already um, on understanding how connected some of these populations are? For instance, Alaria marginata in Barkley Sound has been found to have 11 kilometers, and there's different genetic signatures from one population to another. So that has like implications if you're collecting within 50 kilometers sure. of our farms. Sure. Uh, what I know is mostly about uh, Neriocystis. Um, I know that Saccharina has been studied pretty significantly, and there's probably more information about metapopulations and population connectivity of sugar kelp. Um, we know its temporal life cycle in Puget Sound, and it's distributed pretty widely, uh, sugar kelp is. I think what we know about distribution uh, comes from our resource agency especially recently with distributions in the south and the central basin. Um, with regards to bull kelp, most of what I know comes from uh, the Alberta lab in, U, uh, Wisconsin. in Wisconsin. And the microsatellite analysis done there telling us there's effectively two groups, a coastal group and an inland sea group, and that there's a mixing, an area of mixing. In Admiralty Inlet, um, it's been just they. There was a postdoc there that was looking at genetics of, I think, primarily bull kelp, but um, also some saccharinas. And the way she explained it to me was that it is a, and and Philippe will will echo this that bull kelp is a has very little genetic diversity within populations. So even a given kelp bed is not going to be very diverse, and it's not going to be terribly different from the one that's um, some distance away. Um, and that's effectively what I know. Yeah, and I guess like for some of the um, like the kelps that have got the pneumatocysts on it, 
really mm -hmm. helps with genetic connectivity as well because they're able to sure. float. So I guess I'm wondering for other seaweeds commonly cultivated like Saccharina and Alaria, like do we have to have, are, are they more similar within that population because they don't have that opportunity to, you know, drift their genes to another however many kilometers down? Yeah. Well, Saccharina is a much more diverse genus. There's lots and lots of species there. It's relatively young. Um, there's probably, therefore, more genetic diversity. Um, we are talking about cultivar development with uh, bull kelp, for instance, and our, you know, we look to uh, Philippe uh, for a lot of our questions about um, how, what are the numbers that we should be starting with, uh, how do we uh, organize our germplasm, and we're taking our cues really from them, and, and I think that he feels that all of the things that we are doing are sort of overkill for the diversity that we're dealing with. Um, but, uh, yeah, that's just what he says. I think the answer is we don't know a lot. Yeah, that's why I'm here. <laughs> that's why you're here. Um, so the real question is, how do we, yeah, and this would not, we can hear this deep stuff, how do we get the answers to that? Yeah. What kind of techniques can we use? What kind of collections do we need to do? What funding we need to have to answer those questions? Yeah. I do Mo moving on. Um, I don't know isn't a good enough answer. <laughs> oh, yeah. And I just wanted to, to remind people of the really good point that there are really different differences among species, like the rafting that can increase connectivity. And, and so making sure that we make our efforts to understand diversity broad, because it really can vary among species. Yeah. yeah. Just not, not only the fact that there's a world besides bull kelp, please, there's, there's all these other species. And they, I, I would offer each one of them do different, have different tricks. Uh, in, in the gametophyte as well as the sporophyte. Yeah. You had another question. I do. Um, what are some of the current diseases in kelp aquaculture here in the Pacific Northwest that we know of and should be aware of as farmers? <laughs> I, can tell, I can tell you about nori aquaculture, but I can't, I yeah. have no idea about kelp. kelp. Anybody? Okay. So, no, I, w I was looking more to y'all who are doing <laughs> it. Um, but there is, you know, there are bacterial diseases that are known from Southeast Asia. And the, the tricky thing with disease, I think, in seaweeds is that they present pretty similarly. Like, the symptoms are very hard to discern. And there's a strong interactive effect with the environment. So you can have a stressor that makes a disease much worse. And so being able to have baseline data, understanding what the disease pressures are, but also the diagnostic tools are really nascent. And also the capacity, like we just don't have people that have training to be able to diagnose what the diseases are. And so that's a big issue moving forward, something that we'd like to, to develop collectively. <laughs> Yeah, and, and just to add, the, the, when I was doing the nori business way back when, the diseases that we encountered were all pretty much the same as the ones they have in Japan, but they were all from here. You could go out and find them anywhere. There was, in other words, the diseases didn't come in with what I what was doing. They were they were already here. <laughs> I say that. <laughs> Meg. Uh, first, I want to see if Simona wanted to respond to the question at all, and then I have a question for both of you. I'm just... Yeah, and so also what I have seen is um, the folk, there are folks in Europe working at SAMS, and there's a whole database on dis seaweed diseases, um, and I can pull up that uh, database. So there's somebody who you can ship a sample to, and they'll, they'll be happy to take it and figure out what disease it is. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, thinking about scaling up and thinking about not having a monoculture of all the same genetics is also important because you can get diseases, you know, and, and you don't want your whole crop to just be, you know, be susceptible to it. So diversifying, I think, is also super critical. Good point. I'll stand on my tiptoes. 
close a bit, and I think this will have to be the last question because I'm also the timekeeper, so I'm going to cut myself off, <laughs> but not you. Um, both I just got the, I got the four minute signal. Oh, Are okay, you going to talk that long? Go ahead. <laughs> um, so, a question for both of you. You both spoke about um, selectively breeding for heat tolerance. Um, you know, physically, there has to be a limit um, for cold water species uh, that would grow here. Do, can either of you comment on what you think that might be? You know, um, how close, how high a temperature do you think selectively bred seaweeds could potentially tolerate? And also, um, if you want to get into the micro of it, uh, the equally important and yet invisible. A long time ago, I was a microbial geneticist, and that was so long ago, I barely remember. But the microbial world and how important that is to the health of the kelp and the ecosystem, there's got to be a heat tolerance threshold there as well. So probably not a lot known yet, but take a stab if you want. <laughs> I, I think, you know, that's, I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but I think that's a great question. And again, you would have to, you know, um, back in, when I was working on my PhD, I, um, Charlie had this gradient table where basically we had little Petri dishes and we'd grow um, the little kelp gametophytes in those and look at temperature. So you'd have cold water, you know, colder water on one side, it's re recirculating, and then warm water on the other side and then there's a gradient of like five petri dishes so you have a gradient of temperatures and then we looked at you know uh, male gametophytes female gametophytes and then sporophytes um, and i mean that that's something that you I, I don't think there's like a clear cut answer so i think you know we should run some tests and and find out like what is a temperature tolerant for for bull kelp or for Alaria or for, um, you know, you could look at ranges. I know bull kelp does occur in Southern California, so um, is it the same population? Probably not, but is that one more tolerant to temperature than what's growing up here? You know, um, all those things could get answered, um, you know, if, if there's somebody to take that on, but I, um, so, so that's, that's not a concrete answer, but I think there are ways to address that question, um, you know, and, and looking at the, again, it's important to look at the microscopic generation as well as the, the sporophytes to see if gametophytes have a different temperature tolerance. We've, actually, there's been a little, uh, Brooke Weigel has done some of this. There's been some work done. 18 degrees kind of is the magic number that keeps popping up in all this when things when things go wrong. Anyway, we need to get going, right? Okay. I was just going to highlight Brooke's work and that there's and that the importance of kind of understanding the differences between life stages and that those tolerance can vary. And Robin too is working on that. The life stages, the temperature tolerances vary between gametophyte stage and porous sporophyte stage. Or so, if you have any particular questions, yeah, Robin, Robin, <clears throat> yeah, right here can probably answer much more questions. Than, but great, I threw some things in here. You got any closing statements or? I think we, we just presented more questions than answers, but that's at least the whole idea. It's, it's something to think about. <laughs> All right. Thank you all. All right. Next up, we have uh, the Integrated Multitrophic Aquaculture, or IMTA, and Co-Culture panel discussion with, looking for them, Erin Meyer from the Seattle Aquarium as our moderator. Here she is, moderator. Yep. Thank you, Nicole. And this one, we are bringing in a remote panelist. And Carrie's giving me the thumbs up. I don't even know what I was asking for. Um, they're in the Zoom room, which means I'm going to go look for them while our two panel, our other panelists are assembling. And then I'll turn it over to you, too. OK. Let me just uh, make sure that James is out there. Hmm. You can be up there in those slides. Just this one down here. Yep. Well, there is James. James, can you hear us? 
when we don't I can hear you loud and clear. Can you hear me? Great. So we could see yeah. stop the share. Right. So stop share. We're going to look at There you go. You can just yeah. be really big. Yeah. James, you're on the you're on the big screen. Okay. I will leave you. You're, you're going to be the largest face on the panel, James. <laughs> Glad to hear it. <laughs> So good. All right. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. I'm sorry that I missed the morning sessions. I was at another conference in Seattle this morning, hence why I'm all schmancy dressed up. Uh, but I would have changed the jeans if I had time. Uh, but anyway, so I'm sorry that I missed your panels and discussions this morning, um, but really happy to be here for the rest of the day today. So as Meg said, uh, this panel for the next hour or so um, is focused around integrated multi-trophic aquaculture, so IMTA. We're gonna unpack what the benefits are, what the present status is, and what's next. We don't have slides, so I'm just gonna walk through some questions with each of our panelists. There's a microphone somewhere, because I don't wanna see it up here. Now it's on, because I'm gonna sit down over here. Um, <clears throat> so we're gonna blend introductions for each of our panelists with our first question to just kick things off. Because when we did our prep for this panel, uh, I think we talked for like over an hour. So there's, there's plenty, plenty of exciting things that folks on the panel wanna share with you all. Um, so to kick it off, uh, we're gonna have, I'll go around for each of the panelists to give their name, uh, their affiliation, and then they're gonna answer their first question. So they're gonna talk a little bit about um, why IMTA first emerged in their perspective and what the benefit are, benefits are to IMTA. And because you're sitting next to me, Joth, we're gonna start with you um, and kick us off with a Washington perspective. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, sadly, you get me again. Um, I, I'm standing in for um, our farm manager, Charlie Delius, who's, uh, who's originally tapped for this um, job, but he's out planting seaweeds today. So um, I wanna be um, really accurate. Um, we, the, the, the definitions are important. Um, IMTA, it's Integrated Multitrophic Aquaculture. The operative word is multitrophic. Um, and and that's, that would be um, compared to co-culturing, which is, is a, probably a better definition of what we do now. Because to demonstrate um, IMTA, you actually have to demonstrate that there are energy transformations between um, the different trophic levels, okay? That's not trivial. Um, it's, it's been done um, in Eastern Canada. There's loads of research there, and as well as in Asia. But, but what we do, um, we, we're co-culturing, um, and what we're co-culturing is sugar kelp and, uh, and Pacific oysters. And um, we are super excited about it because we think it offers opportunities um, for basically maximizing productivity um, and on a, on a very limited um, um, seascape. And I have lots more to say about how we might do, it, do that, but I'll, I'll pass the mic to Tiffany. To you. Yeah, to me only because I think I forgot to introduce myself. Oh. <laughs> so that's fun. Uh, so I'm Dr. Erin Meyer. I'm the Director of Conservation Programs and Partnerships at the Seattle Aquarium. So I direct our research and field conservation and policy work that we do. And that's all that I'll say in my intro. Um, and then actually, I think I was going to uh, toss it over to James virtually next uh, to introduce himself, so his name, where, where he works, where he is right now might be helpful uh, for all of you as well. Um, and then to say from his perspective what the benefits are of IMTA or co-culture. Yeah, you bet. And hello, everyone. Uh, yeah, so I'm joining you all from Juneau, Alaska. Uh, I've got uh, some various experiences in kind of the kelp aquaculture space. I spent, um, I'm from Alaska originally, but spent the last decade or much of the last decade in Maine, um, uh, where for a while I was the kelp supply director for Atlantic Sea Farms and ran our nursery, as well as buying operation from the fishermen farmers that we worked with. Um, and yeah, they are, I got kind of a, a firsthand look uh, at co-culture, I think as, as Josh said, is a better term for it, um, helping some mussel farmers there uh, start adding shellfish or adding kelp to their operation, which ended up being a real, real success. 
Um, and yeah, now I am back in Alaska in my home state. Um, I am uh, based here in Juneau doing some work with various uh, new farmers, uh, kelp and shellfish farmers up here, as well as uh, finally getting my master's degree here at the University of Alaska. Um, and yeah, I kind of wanted to put a plug in for this sort of um, uh, this research, growing research group we have up here in Juneau um, at the University, University of Alaska and the NOAA campuses here. Um, uh, led by my advisor and friend, uh, Sherry Monzor, and then the aquaculture research lead at NOAA, Jordan Hollersmith. And we've got a lot of research going on into um, kind of expanding the range of species that we're cultivating up here in Alaska, including current projects in bull kelp, um, which still there's a lot of kinks uh, unintended to work out with uh, um, in, in aquaculture, uh, abalone, and then we're hoping to do some work with scallops and sea cucumbers pretty soon. Um, yeah, and I'm excited to be presenting to you all because, uh, you know, I think there's just tons of connections, shared connections between Alaska and Washington with many of the same species growing in our waters, as well as the fact that our supply chain inevitably runs through Washington and gets a lot of our stuff gets processed down there. So it's, uh, yeah, great to be continuing to connect with you all. And I would like to invite anybody that wants to come up to Juneau and, and see our operations up here to, to make a visit. But yeah, when I think about um, IMTA or co-culture, I kind of try to divide it into the the roles that the the different uh, species play for each other. And I can generally think of four things, four ways that that happens. One is feeding relationships. So that's generally, um, you know, uh, kelp gaining nutrients from the waste of shellfish and vice versa, the detrital matter from the kelp may be going um, and being consumed by different shellfish. And, and that's an interesting one because there's definitely varying levels of that where it seems like mussels probably eat a lot more kelp detritus than say oysters. Um, there's the ocean acidification remediation angle, which is a big one that, that Joth knows a ton about. Um, uh, there's pest control, which I think is kind of an underlooked one of, of uh, um, you know, the idea of sticking like periwinkles in your oyster bags or something like that to uh, to have them just eat off the fouling um, so you don't have to do that yourself. And there's also a pretty cool study from Chris Gobler's lab at Stony Brook that just that came out in the last year showing that kelp may have the potential to actually remediate harmful algal blooms locally or or at least if grown at a large scale. So that's kind of a new area. And then I would say probably the most important reason for co-culture at this point is just economic. Um, up here in Alaska, the costs to get an aquaculture lease are pretty high, you know, the biggest cost for, for kelp growers up here probably. And if you're only utilizing that space for six months of the year, growing kelp or eight months of the year, then you're, um, you know, you're not utilizing a lot of that sunk costs. Um, you know, if you have a kelp farm and you're trying to harvest 10,000 pounds a day in the spring, you need a big old boat to do that. Um, but uh, if you don't, you're not doing anything with that boat in the summer, that's not going to let you pay those bills very easily. Um, and just, you know, also utilizing the space on your farm to maximum effect. Kelp lines can be seven feet down in the water column where often shellfish gear will be right at the surface. So maybe you can compact those together in a farm um, more so than you would uh, just a single species. So uh, yeah, those, that's kind of uh, all the, uh, how I frame it in my head. Um, yes, I'll pass it on. Thanks, James. Uh, Joth, at, at some point, I want to come back to you and hear a little bit about what uh, James shared and how that kind of reflects back um, into what's happening here in Washington. But first, I want to let Tiffany get a chance to introduce herself uh, and uh, say a little bit about why IMTA and what you think the benefits are. No, thanks so much. So my name is Tiffany Waters, and I work at the Nature Conservancy. Um, so I'm our global aquaculture manager. Uh, a lot of the work that I do is actually in our seaweed initiative. So TNC started really focusing on aquaculture maybe five, six years ago. It's a relatively new strategy for us um, as an ENGO. And we were really thoughtful about um, why we were engaging in aquaculture and how to engage in aquaculture. And um, part of that is that one of our 
mandates as an organization is how do you feed and you know provide water to people sustainably with a growing population. And so when you zoom out um, globally and you look at how you know different lower trophic species like shellfish and seaweeds compare, they really stack up really well um, from a resource utilization perspective. Um, water resources, land resources, feed conversion ratio, um, there's all a lot of really great things there when it comes to aquaculture when it's done well. <laughs> um, and um, that's really key. Um, and so in addition to that, um, we've lost a lot of our global reefs um, um, from you know corals to oysters to uh, seaweed forests. And so we think that there can be a place for um, aquaculture when done well to help provide some of those missing ecosystem services um, that were missing from those reefs. Um, so in terms of you know, some of the seaweed work that we're doing, um, we focus a lot on improving practices um, within these kind of well-established countries like Indonesia, Tanzania. We have emerging work in Belize as well. Um, but we also are doing some science projects as well um, around things like co-culture. So we currently have a project in the water right now in both Maine and New Zealand where we're looking at co-culture of seaweeds and mussels together. And in particular, um, habitat provisioning. So really looking at um, how do those compare when it comes to habitat for fish and invertebrates for um, gear on its own, just seaweed, seaweed and uh, mussels. Um, so that's been some fun work. We're actually wrapping that up. We're about two and a half years into that project. Um, so um, when I think about um, IMTA, I completely agree with Joth. I think um, you're going to hear IMTA, co-culture, polyculture, and a lot of people want to kind of put all of those in the same category. And um, there is a difference there in terms of kind of this nutrient uh, story, such that you can have different uh, species at different trophic levels, um, such that the kind of excess or waste from one species is feeding the other species. Um, and that's incredibly important, but also incredibly variable depending on your local ecological conditions. And so, um, so that's where IMTA can get pretty complicated. Um, I will say, when I think about IMTA, I immediately go to China. Um, just so in terms of globally, um, many people may realize this, maybe not. China's kind of the juggernaut, right? So you have China producing aquaculture way up here, and then you've got all the rest of us down here. Um, so they produce just a huge amount of aquaculture. Um, and according to them, at this point, um, I think it's 50% of their marine aquaculture and 80% of their freshwater aquaculture is polyculture. Um, and so, you know, what's the reason behind that? Part of that is that, you know, China has a massive history with aquaculture. Some of their freshwater species, carp in particular, goes back 8,000 years. Um, but it's actually kind of more than that. It's when they started to really intensify aquaculture, 50s, 60s, 70s, they put a lot of finfish aquaculture in because um, they eat a lot of fish within China. And what they found was that they had a lot of pollution. And so they started to really run to their ecological limits. And so um, I think it was in the 90s and early aughts, they really started to put in more shellfish and seaweed um, in order to make sure that they could still have a viable industry and be able to still produce um, you know, the fish they want to, to grow. And so it was actually kind of a, ma a requirement in a lot of ways in a lot of places of China. Um, another reason why that works for them, though, is because seaweed's very valuable in China. So a lot of people eat seaweed. So in addition to being the number one producer <laughs> of seaweeds and shellfish and, you know, all sorts of other things in the world, they're also the number one buyer of seaweeds in the world. Um, so they not only, and if they could grow the tropicals, they would. <laughs> it's just that they um, have more of a, a temperate climate. And so... Um, so seaweed is something that's very highly valued within China. So I think that's just my, when I start to think about um, IMTA and co-culture, that's kind of where my brain tends to go. Gosh, okay, so just in that uh, introduction, there are several themes kind of just pulling them out for us. So there are a lot of implications around IMTA, of course. One of the things, you know, reflecting on what's been said is that when IMTA, which kind of doesn't truly exist yet, um, when done right, or at least the predictions around what happens when done right, is that the system becomes self-sustaining. It's less work for the farmers, it's less work overall, because the system is restoring and re regenerating itself. 
Um, and when done, you know, taking it a step further beyond IMTA, it could actually become regenerative and help to restore the ecosystem that sits around it. Um, so just kind of putting those plugs out there for us as we're continuing this conversation. But some of the implications that all three of the panelists have touched on is economic security for the farmers themselves. Uh, food security is something that a couple of our panelists have touched on. Um, some implications around climate change and how that's changing ecosystems and something like IMTA, so going beyond co-culture, can help create a more sustainable space against climate change. Um, but then also this uh, kind of emerging themes, it sounds like, around restoring ecosystems system services. So I might pick up on the one uh, that I wanted to tag between uh, James and Joth first in thinking about um, economic security and food security, uh, taking some of the examples of what James mentioned and how that might uh, be, how we're thinking about that here in Washington. Sure. Thanks, Aaron. Um, yeah, no, um, James brought up some good, some good synergies um, between, among trophic levels for, for co-culture or IMTA applications. I, for us, um, we, we're really focused on um, utilization of the water column. We have a small footprint. Um, most farms have pretty small footprints, especially um, surface or suspension farms. And so for, for Blue Dot C Farm, we are most interested in, in utilizing the water column um, optimally. For grow, in, in our case, we grow oysters on the surface and we grow seaweeds at about three meters or 10 foot depth, okay? So that, though, that's pretty useful. And uh, what the, but I think ultimately what we're really talking about, and this touches on what Tiffany said and, and James, that we really want to do is, is try to utilize the water column um, sustainably. And for, for example, take an oyster. An oyster um, excretes a little bit of nitrogen. If you're growing seaweed near that oyster or next to that oyster, there's a, every likelihood that the, that the seaweed would pick up that nitrogen, okay? Now, if you add, add a, um, a, a sea cucumber, the, the oyster is also um, producing biodeposits. Sea, cu sea cucumbers love biodeposits, so they, you could add see, see them add to the mix. Um, and then, for example, you could then throw, throw in a sea urchin. Sea urchins love, as, we've, as we know well, um, in, in, in California waters, for example, sea urchins feed on, on seaweeds. And so you can envision a system where all of those different trophic levels are essentially being serviced and, and producing protein. So I look at it really in terms of, okay, in a volume of seawater, um, or freshwater, but in our case seawater, what, what, how could you potentially maximize the protein that's pr produced in that, in that volume? by using different, different species at, at different trophic levels. And I think that's the challenge. And, I, for, and for, for myself, um, and, you know, and James mentioned Chris Gobler's work at Stony Brook, he actually has also been instrumental in demonstrating the utility of growing seaweeds near, near, uh, near mussels. Um, and, that, and the mussels are growing better because there's, the pH is, is a little bit better. Uh, for conditions there, um, less CO2 in the water, um, and uh, the pH is a little bit higher. Mussels are mussels have thicker shells; they're doing better. That's all wonderful, and we should be taking advantage of those applications. We we um, we had some work done at Hood Head during the um, Paul Allen project. Um, again, as as it's been well demonstrated, we um, our currents out there are, are such that it's, it was very difficult to see a signal. Um, due to the growing of seaweeds. But we're in process now designing gear that would and potentially um, house um, animals, um, including well, seaweeds and animals at different trophic levels so that they potentially could maximize, say, a cu the cubic, you know, say a five or 10 cubic liter volume in the water column. And, and the water coming, coming in and going out would be a better, going out would be a better quality going in. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity for the design of gear that would enhance, basically, I think the secret is putting, for example, with seaweeds, putting the seaweeds in as close proximity to the, to the shellfish or the urchins or whatever um, is the key. You've got to have them right next to each other for it to all work out. And I think that's a, an engineering challenge, but again, gets to this notion of utilizing the water column for food production, because as I mentioned this morning, we're we're um, you know we're eight billion on the planet. We've got to figure out how we're going to raise enough food 
and that includes a lot of seafood for the planet. So we, we, there's a lot of work to do, but I firmly believe that um, using a co-culture or IMTA approach, which you, which you can document, is, this, is, a, is a major solution for us. Yeah, and when we're, if we're honest with ourselves about what this is going to look like in Washington, we're never going to have big, giant seaweed, seaweed farms because we have very limited space we're talking about, which has a bunch of different uses in it. Um, and so you know, maximizing how you're using the space that's allocated for your farm is only going to help you be more, uh, for the farmers in the room, uh, be more economically sustainable. Um, for the researchers in the room, I hope you have your ears perked up because there's a lot of interesting research questions, at least that are popping into my head and hopefully yours as well, and some opportunities to partner with the farmers who are here to better understand trophic transfer, to figure out how to do this in a way um, that makes it truly IMTA and truly we're seeing you know, trophic transfer across. Um, I'm going to pause and see, Tiffany, if you want to respond to anything that Joss said from you know, what you're learning or what you've heard about how you know, China and others who have been doing this for a bit longer in the co-culture space, um, and if they're doing any of uh, experimentation around uh, other than uh, you know, the typical kelp and shellfish pairing, if they're doing anything else like that. Yeah, no, thank you. So um, I would say that, you know, in general, it's um, kind of a fin fish with bivalve and seaweed game. Um, that's really where you're going to see kind of some of your most um, direct benefits right away, just because you have a fed species. And so anytime you have a fed species, you're going to have excess feed and you're going to have, in addition to the refuse that the actual species is producing on its own. And so that tends to be where you see, um, Joss was mentioning some really great data out of Canada. I'm guessing at Thierry Chopin, who is one of the originators of the term IMTA. Um, and it reminds me actually of what he said as well. Um, he had a great article out recently, and I think he said, you know, IMTA is a concept, it's not a formula. <laughs> and I think he was trying to remind everyone, you know, that this is something that really needs to be worked through at the local level um, and how important those local ecological conditions are to making things work. Um, and so, so yes, yeah, so to answer your question, though, I would say globally when it comes to actually seeing that IMTA, it generally is a fed species, generally fin fish, along with seaweed. Seaweeds are incredible nutrient scrubbers, <laughs> and it makes complete sense to have seaweed along with your, along with your uh, fin fish farm every time. Um, operationally, it's diff it can become difficult, because you're absolutely right. It needs to be um, you know, within the same sphere to be able to pick up some of that, um, that refuse, which can be challenging. You're not going to have seaweed underneath a fish farm. It needs to have that light. And so, um, so that's where, again, some of these operational challenges come in. Um, but I would say, definitely going back to local e ecological conditions are really important. How you design your farm. Um, and you know what are the market species that people are interested in locally? Um, so I have a lot of respect and think that this is where the work starts is more bottom up rather than top down. You know, um, I love all my environmental colleagues, but we love IMTA as a concept <laughs> and say, you know, hey, go plop this in the water over there, and shouldn't it work? And shouldn't this just be magical for the environment? Um, and in reality, it often means that you should start operationally first to say, how can you actually harvest these together in a way that's economically viable, in a way that's not going to have biofouling, um, and also in a way that's going to be um, utilizing more of the water column. Um, and then I think you can get there environmentally. Um, so, yeah. Can I add just one more point? I, um, uh, Bangs Island, uh, mussels in Maine, I think the observation there is that they're, they're getting better quality kelp in the growing in the vicinity of mussels because the mussels are actually feeding on the um, invertebrate larvae that will be following the kelp, which is, extends the season that they can actually harvest the kelp, which was a kind of a really interesting observation. So I'll just throw that out. Yeah, and to touch on that point, I know um, Nicole Price talked about kind of shell strength earlier. Uh, the, the mussels that were grown in Bangs Island had thicker shells when they were grown around kelp, but uh, I also think that they found that the mussels also had bigger meats, which is, you know, uh, uh, not going to be a production, but, you know, might be related to ocean acidification, but very well could be because they're just eating that kelp. So, 
James, that's perfect. So I was going to throw it over to you next because of our panelists, you're the one who's talked a bit about how you're thinking about adding something beyond just uh, kelp and mussels or kelp and a bivalve. Um, so just wanted to hear from you a little bit about why you're thinking about the couple of species you're, want, you want to experiment with and what kind of information or what kinds of questions do you have that you need answered before you think you can you know, really move forward with it? Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, so I mean, you know, this might be uh, just me still kind of uh, a little pie in the sky moving up to Alaska and seeing all these species that I haven't learned about yet. But um, I do know coming from Maine, we had quite a um, quite a kind of a growing number of species that have been cultivated. Um, one that was really exciting there is the, uh, the uh, sea scallop, the Atlantic sea scallop has got quite a bit of momentum in Maine and um, they've been growing it on long lines uh, that would just fit in really well with kelp, uh, kelp cultivation systems. Uh, and so coming up to Alaska, I've been exploring, trying to explore the viability of uh, different species of scallops. Uh, weather vane scallops is one that we have a lot of, a, a lot more of, I think, up here in Alaska, but there is stocks of down there in Washington. And it's a um, very related species to uh, the species uh, of scallop that is grown primarily in Japan and China that is a multi-billion dollar industry. Um, so that's an interesting one for me. I think, um, I think IMTA really kind of first, or co-culture really first clicked when I was uh, at the International Seaweed Symposium in Korea. I think that Simona mentioned just seeing these uh, massive kelp farms right next to massive abalone farms where they would just go up to the kelp farms with a barge and uh, grab a big old pile of kelp, throw it onto the barge, and then truck it over to the abalone cages and just toss it right in there. Um, and, you know, that's something that I think abalone farming is going to be pretty tricky until we've got more kelp in the water. Um, but if you have, uh, you know, if, you, if you've done any kelp farming, you inevitably know that it's going to be pretty hard to keep all of that kelp uh, perfect for human consumption. You always get some spots that end up kind of ratty or some tails that are, you know, covered with snails or something like that, that is going to gross somebody out of Whole Foods, but isn't going to gross those abalone out. So uh, uh, having some, uh, having some kind of diversity of products that the kelp can go into like, like abalone like that is, is a really interesting one. And then the, the pinto abalone species that we have um, all along the West coast is also very similar to the, the abalone species that's grown at mass in, in China or China and Korea. So and then I think sea, sea cucumbers is is also um, Joth and those others have touched on it is just kind of a consumes all sorts of things um, and I, I, Tiffany would probably know I've seen more about this than me but I, I think the way that it's been uh, cultivated elsewhere is just kind of through ranching through kind of distributing it on the ocean bottom uh, below uh, different farms and then and then harvesting it once they're to a certain size. And sea cucumbers, you know, it's there's a pretty valuable sea cucumber dye fishery up here in Alaska. It's sold to China as an aphrodisiac. And those kind of high value fisheries um, often are kind of the ticket to making these farms viable, especially as they're kind of in the starting starting phases. So um, those three species, I think I've got a lot of interest in, but I'd love to hear from the other panelists as well. Yeah, I'd, I'd call out Andy Subia, who's in the room somewhere. Um, he's been working with sea, sea cucumbers for the last five, six years at least. And uh, talk, to, talk to Andy if you want to talk about sea cucumbers. Um, he's, he's really up to speed. No, I would agree. I know very little about sea cucumbers. <laughs> we have um, a, a something up on our reef resilience network. We have a, a, a partner out of Madagascar that actually um, does some ranching of sea cucumbers. We just integrated some of their information into our aquaculture 101 for reef managers. So if anyone does want to go check that out, we do have some resources up online about general ways to cultivate, um, but not really my, my area of expertise. So I will also... So uh, there are others in the audience here who have um, experience raising sea cucumbers and pinto abalone. So we have representatives here from the Puget Sound Restoration Fund um, who have been learning a lot about raising pinto abalone and cucumbers over the last while, let's just say. Um, and just a note for those who aren't aware, so here in Washington, pinto abalone are a fully protected endangered species. So we lost about 95% of their population in just about 50 years of a recreational harvest. Awesome. 
so they're now fully protected, and the Puget Sound Restoration Fund, Department of Fish and Wildlife, and NOAA have been working for a couple decades um, toward their recovery um, and established a couple of satellite rearing facilities. Uh, we're a partner now at the aquarium. We have a nursery um, on site as well as the Port Townsend Marine Science Center. Um, so really, if you're if you're interested in learning a bit more about how to cultivate abalone, you've got some partners to tap into here in Washington. Uh, particularly PSRF, because uh, they've been doing it for a decade and a half. Uh, we've learned a lot. Um, and that's one, you know, that if that's something that gets integrated into an IMTA structure here in Washington, that could also, if you have surplus animals, that, um, or maybe a percentage of what's being grown, can also be contributed into recovering the wild population. So that's another, you know, my ears perk up when I start thinking about endangered species being linked in with IMTA, because that's a way to help regenerate our local ecosystems and make the ecosystems themselves more sustainable, which in turn is only gonna make the Puget Sound and the broader Salish Sea, you know, more habitable to things like aquaculture, if the health of the Salish Sea is going up itself. And I think Betsy would like to say something. Yeah. Um, just one point on that. In one of this morning's panel sessions, the ones with um, up here with the different people who were sharing their perspectives on what, why they were farming seaweeds, Diane Boratin, the woman who's been doing tank culture, she has been actually producing bull kelp that we have been using to feed our pinto abalone at the abalone nursery, and that's something that she started to do within the last year or so. And what that means is that it reduces pressure on the wild kelp forest, which is where we had previously been collecting bull kelp to feed our abalone. So a benefit out in the wild, a benefit to the abalone that we're growing for recovery. So it is being done at a very small scale within a tank culture, but more there to do. Thanks, Betsy. So let's see. We've got about 20 minutes or so left. I do have a finishing question, but I think I want to do the finishing question for all of you after we turn it over to some discussion from the audience and questions from the audience. How much, how much time do I have? Wrap it. Oh, just kidding. Cool. All right. So let's say we have seven minutes for questions from the audience, and then we'll go around with the final question to the panelists uh, to close out as they're thinking about the most important thing to consider for the future of IMTA. So this will give you seven minutes to think about your answer. Uh, so we'll turn it over for questions to the audience. So as usual, you've got cards. There are microphones. Um, we welcome you forward with any questions you have for our panelists. Yeah, hello, Vera Trainer. Um, I have a question about maybe bringing the last session together with this one. Are there certain co-cultured species that are more susceptible to disease than others? I've heard that one of the problems with IMTA is disease. So is there some research that's being done there and are you know certain couplets better than others? Thanks. I, I don't, I'm not aware of that, Vera. Um, the, um, certainly the, I would, I would put it this way, that um, if you can create the conditions for optimal culture for the, say, the two or three species you're trying to do in co-culture, you're gonna actually reduce the potential for disease because they'll be less stressed. And that's, you know, there's another component, um, and that's it's the big elephant in the room, it's climate change. And, and all of the critters that we're rearing in, uh, in culture are all going to be um, experiencing higher, more high, high stress and need to be grown potentially in more resilient conditions. And I think that that's again where the research comes in for enabling co-culture IMTA applications to optimize the place that the actual conditions that will be vital to have in place to be able to continue to um, basically to grow food. James, did you want to answer? I haven't. S I should just have you raise your hand before we go to the next question or something. Yeah, I don't have. I don't have too much to add to that one. Okay, great. Hello, my name is Sam Klein. I'm with the Pacific Coast Shellfish Growers Association, and I've been wondering this entire day um, what are the major, I guess, barriers or reasons that shellfish growers in Washington State aren't um, doing more co-culture and growing seaweed. Um, and how could organizations like mine um, 
yeah, aid growers in exploring those options? Big picture, social license. We, uh, we as, a, as a community of shellfish growers and farmers, uh, need to basically do a better job of um, basically showcasing what we, what we do and why we do it. And I come back to the big picture again of it's about food security, it's about rural employment, it's about a whole suite of issues that um, we have an, an abundance here in, Wa in Washington and on the West Coast in general. And I feel that there's an opportunity to be basically growing, growing our economies um, with, um, in concordance with us, with sustainable um, and, and basically a, 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 an industry that can, can, that can help farm the sea. And I, so I think it comes down, to, as you probably know, permitting and application and, and all of those issues. James? I'll just Sorry, I couldn't, I couldn't hear that question very well. Could you, um, oh, could you repeat it? I can repeat it into the mic. Can you hear it better from here? Okay, okay perfect. Uh, so the question was, what are the barriers to shellfish growers adding kelp or doing cold culture? I don't know if you can speak to that from other places too, if not Washington. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I think that it depends on the location. I think... Um, it, yeah, there's a lot about gear setups. So in, in Washington, uh, you know, it's going to be a big part of it's going to be just that, um, you know, you need to grow kelp in some depth. Otherwise, it's just going to get really fouled up in the shallows. Um, and so for a lot of Washington farms that are intertidal, that's just going to be really tough. Um, and even in Maine, you know, where there's more floating gear for oysters, a lot of the times you want to have the oysters in really shallow bays that are going to get warm. Um, and that's the ver very true in Alaska where we have a lot of cold water to deal with. So kind of figuring out um, places where both can grow together is is harder than it looks, I would say. Um, and then mussel farming, you know, you the most effective way to, to grow has been on these big mussel rafts. Um, and, uh, you know, that works okay with kelp, but it would, if there was a way to do like long line mussels combined with long line kelp, that would just make for kind of easier gear arrangements. Um, so I think, um, I think, yeah, figuring out the ways that you can have gear that work well with the two is is um, a, something that's had a lot of developments. Uh, and I think Joss's farm, Blue Dot, is a really good example of that. And more, more farmers up here in Alaska are, are figuring out how to combine the two better. So the material scientists and the uh, innovative engineers in the audience, there's a call to you from that. I think we'll take the next question from this mic. Yeah, hello. Uh, I'm Eric Dow from University of Washington, a grad student. Uh, my question is, uh, has there been any research or is there any knowledge around the impact on microplastics in co-culture IMTA um, setups? Like, do they decrease the amount that shellfish are seeing inside their muscle or increase? I'm not, I'm not aware. It's a good question. Um, the, in the microplastics world, um, for shellfish, it's mainly it's mainly fibers um, that are being ingested, and so systems that um, that obviously don't break down is incredibly important. Uh, and uh, but as far as the the intersection of co-culture or IMTA with a reduction in microplastics, I'm not I'm not aware of any work in that area. I wish I could call my team. Uh, so we do microplastics research at the aquarium, um, and I can't actually call them right now and just like give the you know crowdsourced answer. Um, but it sounds like a really great research question. To, I mean, of course, we know that in mussels in particular, there's been a, there's been research that's happened right here locally on mussels and the bioaccumulation of of fibers in their tissues um, and in sea otters. I mean, everything from sea otters all the way down to mussels and humans included. Um, so I'm curious. I feel like I've heard of a paper around that, but um, yep, nodding head in the audience, but I don't remember what it said. <laughs> Was that in co-culture or by itself? And then I'll repeat the answer. I think it was maybe by itself. Okay. 
So, so apparently our Pacific oysters don't necessarily bioaccumulate um, the muscle fibers in them. Um, I know our local muscle, muscles do. There was a grad student at University of Washington, Dr. Lyda Harris, who did her PhD work on that. Um, and then there's work, active work on rockfish and salmon and others where we're seeing terrible things happening to um, the, the smolts and, and other uh, juveniles of various fishes. But um, I, I rain check on that. But great new question for research if there isn't an answer out there. Go this one. We have five minutes. Okay, so uh, quickly last question, and then we're going to jump to final question around the panel. I don't want to take five minutes. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, I just wanted to provide some additional information on the question regarding uh, regulatory barriers to co-culture. Um, there's been a lot of talk of abalone um, as, as a potential species of interest in that regard. And we've um, discussed with the panel some of the investments the state has made into its recovery and its current status. Um, from a regulatory perspective, there's barriers, there's very defined barriers. You cannot legally possess pinto abalone because it's listed as an endangered species in our state. So that would be one piece. Um, regarding other regulatory barriers, and part of it is, is us with WDFW, um, there have been discussions about the potential in sea cucumber culture, in rock scallop culture, in cockle culture, and a number of other native species. And we just had a discussion uh, in one of the previous panels about um, genetic risk considerations with seaweed production. And you know, I would extend that to shellfish as well, and that's kind of where our hesitation comes in. We have a desire to be precautious with the potential for native species in hatchery settings and, and outplant. And, wanting to make sure that we have enough information to be able to do it smartly so that we're not putting native populations at risk in, in that regard. So some of the regulatory barrier is, is with us and, and our, our desire to be precautious in proceeding with native species. So. Time? Okay, quick, yes, it's quickly. It's kind of a big question, unfortunately. Because oh. um, <laughs> we're considering the future of feeding the world and um, I want to just ask, my name's Leah Paisano. I own and operate Lego Bay Shellfish, mostly a Guyanek hatchery, but also entering the world of becoming a seaweed hatchery. We'll see where things go. But I wanted to propose the question to all of you panelists and kind of the room in general about land-based aquaculture. Particularly when we're talking about finfish, we're talking about multitrophic species, and we're talking about like abandoned shopping malls and what we do with these big spaces and how we could possibly incorporate aquaculture into that. And I just wanted to kind of ask that question to everybody. Okay, so can, can we get one minute answers? Okay, go. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I think no, it's a great, great point. Land base has all kinds of opportunities. Absolutely takes away from the... Um, the, the multi-stakeholder problems that are that are inherent to working the sea space. So yeah, absolutely. Um, ports come into mind um, as places to potentially do um, land-based um, aquaculture. Yeah, I would agree. Um, I think that um, when it comes to land-based, there's a lot of potential, especially for fed species. So um, you know, we have something that we call the Blue Revolution Fund that we just made public, which is very exciting. Um, we're the conservation manager on it, but it's an impact capital fund, um, impact investment fund. And the thesis there is to support um, aquaculture production systems that are more sustainable, which includes bivalves and seaweeds um, near shore and offshore, but also looking at some of these newer technologies that are not as well established that we think need more research and money into, which includes offshore fin fish and ras fin fish. Um, and so decoupling that from the near shore marine environment where there can be more impacts. Um, it's tricky though because then, you know, once you go onto land, um, you are using more fresh water, you are using more land, um, but I think there's definitely a place for it, for sure. Perfect, all right, so yeah, clean say, oh, uh, go ahead, James. Oh, I would say, um, there's been a lot of kind of talk about land aquaculture in Maine recently, especially with some some big proposed land-based salmon farms. Um, it's been a really interesting kind of uh, thing to uh, look at from the outside. Um, I think costs is really, you know, it's a big one. It's just a lot of energy costs to, to have, um, you know, all that uh, heating and uh, light uh, um, for on onshore systems. Um, I think that I think one really cool 
potential is kind of hybrid farms or, you know, a farm where like if you were going to do a pinto abalone farm, it might make sense to grow them on land for a year or, you know, for something like that before, you know, for a longer period in a nursery setting and then putting them out in the wild. I mean, it's something we're curious about up in Alaska, especially in places where there's a lot of uh, hydro energy or wind energy um, that make those some of those energy costs a lot cheaper. But it's definitely, definitely something that I'm sure will grow over the years. All right. So in a minute or less, what is the final point that you would like to make, James, around the the future of IMTA? What's the most important thing you want people to consider? I would just say, um, you know, for any growers in the audience, just start out with kind of what makes sense from a business model. Um, don't try and do things just because they kind of sound cool or um, because uh, they might have some environmental impacts. I think that the best models of IMTA or of co-culture have been just really practical uh, economic diversification reasons and um, things like that. So I would just say start simple and then as we go, we'll learn about kind of these really cool, uh, more biological functions that that um, come along with it. All right, John? Uh, maximizing the water column through, um, I think, some some good engineering to produce um, those kinds of culture um, culture um, uh, cages that could accommodate seaweeds and shellfish and maybe an, an herbivore. I think that would be a really interesting project. Yeah, I would say um, additional research at the local level, so looking at those really specific local conditions, especially under, um, I agree with what you said earlier, under a climate resiliency lens. I think that um, we need to be thinking now about that in terms of before a lot of these culture species get under stress, um, how do we increase the resilience now, which could very much come about because of co-culture, but um, again, really need to do that research at the local level. All right, thank you panelists, thank you audience for your engagement. Thank you James and Aaron and Joth and Tiffany for a really great panel. We have a almost 15 minute break. Um, we're coming back at, oh, what? You just took away a minute of your break and I'm gonna be bad about that. That's okay. <laughs> there, are, there are cookies and I think fresh coffee. Um, I was told that there was one cookie per person, so if you've already had one, just hold back for a minute and see if other people want theirs. <laughs> and then when we reconvene at, I think it's 2.05, I keep not seeing my schedule, we will have the Indigenous Perspectives panel. All right, we are ready for session four. The only thing standing between you and traffic. <laughs> so enjoy it. <laughs> All right, S session four, I am um, so excited to have a good long conversation or just listening session with these excellent people, all five of them who have joined us in person today. I just want to acknowledge something. This is one of those event planning things that you just don't think about until the last minute and it's too late to plan. Literally, we had our panel prep session three days ago, I think. Yeah, finally. And they're like, how come? Why are we, why are we waiting until the very tail end of the conference to talk about some of these things that are so important and universal? And I was like, oh, shoot. If I could right now rearrange the whole entire agenda, if we hadn't just emailed it out to you all six times, I would have put this panel um, in the very first session. So thank you for being gracious about that. And um, I'm going to stop talking because you don't want to hear from me. The Indigenous Perspectives panel, and Tiffany is moderating this one. She will introduce herself. Everyone will introduce themselves, and then we'll go from there. Thank you. All right, wonderful. Thank you, Meg, so much. <clears throat> Let's see here if I can get this going. Perfect. Thank you, guys. So um, I'm incredibly um, honored to be moderating the Indigenous Perspectives panel. Um, this is uh, 
really important panel for a lot of different reasons. Um, I'll just go into a couple. Um, one of those is that the tribes in Washington State are the first stewards of our marine resources and our marine species and our terrestrial species and our terrestrial resources, um, and as such have been living with and protecting and restoring and stewarding these resources since time immemorial. And so there's a lot to for them to share and for others to learn from them um, in terms of how they have been stewarding these resources and how they are currently interacting and protecting and managing these resources. Um, many people know this, but tribes in Washington State are absolute leaders in habitat protection. Um, they are the voices saying we are losing more habitat than we are gaining and that we, we cannot continue in this way. We have to start regaining our habitat. So um, that's one reason. Um, a second reason why this panel is so incredibly important, why really appreciative of everyone being here today to share um, you know, their knowledge is what Meg talked about in the very beginning. So thank you, Meg, for framing this um, early on that tribes in Washington State are co-managers of the resources. Um, so they have their rights reaffirmed through both um, Bolt and Rafi decisions. So many of the tribes in Washington are co-managers of the fish and shellfish resources with the state of Washington. And they have legal authorities within these areas. And so um, I'm not gonna go into too much other than that. Everyone, again, my name is Tiffany Waters. I'm a Chinook tribe member. I'm also at the Nature Conservancy. And I'm gonna allow everyone here to introduce themselves. We have representatives um, from Jamestown Squalum tribe, from Suquamish tribe, Skokomish tribe, and Squaxin Island tribe. So I'm gonna kick it off here with you, Lonnie. Aha, testing? Okay. I tang and siam nischaicha siam, yuch siam snatch tiklam nusk iamsen, hatning sanati and satla, yait kuiati and satla, man shot short sin, manu ait squatchy. A uh, very good day to you all, honored friends and relatives. That's how we say in nusk iamutsen, or the sklalam language, the language of the lower Elwa sklalam, the Jamestown sklalam, and the Port Gamble sklalam people. My name is Lonnie Grinnell Greninger, but my Indian given name is Yuchsia, which means inviter. I love that about my name. And uh, that was given to me by my grandmother when I was 15. Nothing magical about the age of 15. It just happened to be the age that I was when, as she, the matriarch of the family, decided it was time to give all of her three children and her nine grandchildren their traditional names. So that's pretty neat. I currently serve my people as the vice chairwoman of, of the tribal council. So for those who might be less familiar with tribal governments and where we stand as sovereign nations, my position, and think about at the position titles as each of us are introducing themselves, they represent entire nations, just like the United States, just like France, Spain. So for me as a vice chairwoman, I represent a, like a vice presidential role in the governing structure of my tribe. So I handle a lot of policy, and then uh, we handle treaty rights, figuring out how to protect our treaty rights and our resources, figuring out how to, in this day and age where we have evolved with new technologies, Western science moving in, how do I take all of that and protect my sovereignty and my treaty rights and my resources and my people, my people and my lands all at the same time? But one thing that's part of my role in, this, in my tribe is I depend on my in-house experts, whether they're native or non-native, I depend on them to help me with a really difficult job, but it's essential. I depend on them to translate Western science methods, tools, and research into our indigenous Jamestown perspective, and then figure out how to beautifully blend those things together so that I am stewarding the lands like I'm supposed to, like the creator told me to thousands of generations ago. That was our job, and it's still our job. It hasn't changed, but things have been evolving, right? We're in these new technologies, new days. We had our own indigenous science, it looked different, but now we gotta blend things together. So that's part of my role, and you'll hear more about my thoughts today on this panel, but just to give an introduction of what my role is here today, and, and I'm really eager to continue speaking with you all and um, sharing my thoughts today. Hello, my name is Azure Bore, uh, Suquamish tribe member. Uh, my Indian name is Tsiotsum. I am the traditional food and medicine program coordinator for our tribe. And so I am more, on, I am not policy, I am more hands on the ground, collect, using our resources, using our resources before we lose them. And so I, my big passion is making sure that this, the information that I'm teaching our youth, our elders, our members 
is those resources are there for their kids, their grandkids, you know, like for generations to come. Um, not only the knowledge that I'm passing on, but also th those resources remain. Um, Suquamish is the birthplace of Chief Seals. We have, who signed the Point Elliott Treaty. The Pacific, or the Puget Sound is a huge, a huge cultural asset to us. Like we lived our lives completely surrounded by the Puget Sound. And so everything that we do and have done kind of revolves around the seasons, the seasonality of what, of the foods that we ate. Our ancestors ate hundreds of types of different foods every year, hundreds. And where are we, dozens? You know, we are, our food diets now are so limited. This was exciting to me to get something more back into our, our tribal members' um, diets, that it's as important as camas. We're also working on the Kalka project. Like, these things are monumental for us as sovereign people. You can't truly be sovereign if you cannot feed yourself. And so this um, type of work, I get really excited. <laughs> I get really excited. And um, so I am a big cheerleader. I'm a great cheerleader. And I am just really happy to be here for that reason. Then I can offer my perspective. And you know, I, I do have a Bachelor of Science, but I don't consider myself a science. I have traditional ecological knowledge. That's my science. Let's um, continue this work together and make sure that these resources are around for a very long time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Jeff Dickerson, and I'm a carpetbagger. I've uh, I was born in Rhode Island, and I came out here uh, 40 years ago, and uh, I stayed, and uh, I have the great honor to work for 36 of those years that I've been here for the Squawks and Island Tribe. As was mentioned earlier, the lands you're on are the lands of the Squawks and Island people. Um, they lived on all these inlets around here in South Puget Sound. So there's a great affinity for the marine waters and all the species that live there. And we continue to be actively involved in addressing those issues. And I, as a fish biologist, serve that role that Lonnie mentioned, that you know, trying to work with science and convey that to the tribal governments. And it's always been a very important consideration for the tribes to have the best scientists available to them. So I'll be interested to answer some of the questions and we'll get into those issues. Hello, my, <clears throat> my name is uh, Blair Paul and um, I'm a, um, a Clinket tribal member from Alaska. My family has moved down to Seattle, um, my grandfather's generation, uh, through a series of, uh, there were lawyers and um, that was where the a lot of legal was, um, decisions were made during that time period. And so I've been grew up in Seattle and have been around the ocean all my life and got involved in um, large algae micro cultivate, micro algae cultivation in Hawaii in the 2007 time frame after finishing a graduate degree at Western. Um, and have, uh, so I spent about three and a half years at, at a big biofuel project there. And when I moved back to the region, started um, consulting with hatcheries and sort of applying that microalgal cultivation knowledge to the shellfish industry. And then um, got involved with uh, Port Gamble Squalum at the time in 2012-13 time period and did a couple years there as a shellfish biologist and, um, and then applied that. So I then moved to a hatchery in, in Shelton, uh, Clamfresh, and then got involved with Skokomish about six years ago and have been their shellfish biologist ever since. Um, and so for the past 10 years, both with Port Gamble and Skokomish, it's my, my duties have really revolved around intertidal shellfish population estimates, um, subtidal gooey duck population estimates, um, crab and shrimp test fisheries, uh, restoration work of Olympia oysters, um, and quota setting process with the co-management system. So we, um, you know, I'm 
responsible to try and uphold the tribe's um, co-management responsibilities and ensuring that we set good good um, targets for harvest and then have adaptive management when things need to be adjusted or, or whatnot. Um, and so that's sort of the perspective that I'll, I'll you know, hold through the conversation today. All right. Well, thank you all for the introductions. Uh, I think we're going to pass it back to Lonnie. And I'm going to kick us off with our first question. So um, what is your tribes and communities' relationships? I'm going to go here a little bit. <laughs> Wait, here we go. I'm scared to touch it since the reverberation of earlier. <laughs> is it? Thank you. Oh, is it pretty good now? Okay, <laughs> thanks. Um, uh, what is your tribe's relationship with kelp and other seaweed as both a natural and cultural resource? Big question, but for however yes. <laughs> you'd like to answer that. All right, I would say that our relationship, so just Jamestown specifically, seaweed and kelp were always a part of our everyday life. So ancestrally speaking, we used kelp and seaweeds to line our cooking pits. So they were insulators to keep in heat, but also moisture for our clams and our camas plants, our prairie plants specifically when we were cooking them for, gosh, uh, sometimes days at a time, weeks at a time, they would be in those pits. Um, we, we ate it on a daily basis or a seasonal basis. And uh, we also used it as, you know, this was really interesting. I just learned this recently. We used bull kelp tubes in storytelling methods, like theatrical methods. And so as someone was on the stage in the longhouse telling stories, somebody would be behind stage making noises in the tube, you know, to add sound effects. It was pretty fun. So that was great. Uh, for when treaty, treaties were signed and uh, when settlers were moving in and we were being removed from our lands, yes, these things happened. Uh, some of our relationship with kelp and seaweed broke. And so now it feels like we're getting acquainted again. And we're learning what, what do we do with seaweed now? How do we reintroduce it into our diets? Like uh, she was saying earlier, because my, my generation, my dad's generation, and I don't think even my grandmother's generation grew up with seaweed in their diets as just an everyday thing. Um, so now it's something that we have, to re, we have to reintroduce to our people. And so we're trying to do that with our traditional cult, uh, foods and culture program. We're trying to do, uh, introduce through like kelp pickles you know, so it's something, pickles are something that we understand now, and so try to introduce those, those uh, ancestral vegetables back into our diets. We're trying that, uh, salsas, things like that. And then we're learning how to harvest it all over again. Um, one of the other things that we have tried to do, uh, we, we had some momentum toward it. We were going to actually do seaweed farming under our net pens for native fish. And it was going to help with the, oh gosh, I'm, I am not a science person, so forgive me. Uh, I depend on my experts for this. Poop. Yes, poop. <laughs> Kelp was going to help with the fish poop. Thank you. <laughs> and we were going to introduce sea cucumbers under those pens as well. So the combination of the sea cucumber and the kelp, you know where I'm going with that. So uh, we lost some momentum with that, uh, unfortunately, when my uh, dad passed away about a year and a half ago. But we have some more staff who are taking on that mantle, and we're just doing some surveys now. So we went back a couple of steps, but it's something we want to continue to do and keep growing in our relationship with seaweed, both for our treaty, uh, but also for learning how to do it or deal with it every day. Although I will say that when I was a kid, we played with it a lot. We threw it at each other. We'd be running around on the sandy beaches, and we would run on it. We would play with it. We would take it and throw it. And of course, you'd get those bull kelp, and you'd whip it around and hit each other with it. And not really safe, but that's what we did. Um, so our... We're growing, is uh, how I'll conclude that statement on our relationship. Thank you. A lot of that, I, was, I, I won't go back over a lot of that, but a lot of that was true for Suquamish as well. Um, one interesting that I read was that uh, we would hold the fish oil in the bowl, in the bulb, in the bulb part, yep. and then that material would be made out of the, the, the bulbous, the, the stipe. Um, Again, like there was a there was a big disconnect for a couple generations. My mom's generation, they didn't get a lot of learning. And if it was, it was go get this, and you don't know you you're not told why or what they're gonna do with it, but you just go get it. You're not told the name of it, or the traditional name. So a lot of that learning was lost with my great grandmother, when the matriarch of our family when she passed, um, and so I feel like 
that's my job. <laughs> Learn all this stuff all over again and not just teach my family, to, but to teach all the families. Um, so I am doing as much research as I can about traditional foods and seaweed. I've gone to two of Jennifer Hans' walks that we've cooked seaweed, like 10 different recipes, and I was just like, this, yes, this. Um, and so COVID, you know, COVID happened and things kind of slowed down. I am a program of one, like I run my program by myself at this point. Um, but there's just so much possibility with this kelp. We did actually, when we went on canoe journey, we were in the San Juans and I had our canoes go pull in a bunch of bull kelp and we made pickles on canoe journey. Like we had the kids clean them, slice them, make the brine, and then we put them in the, the coolers. And every time we stopped, we would check on them and we let them refrigerate in the coolers for like a week. And then when we got to our final destination, we got our chairman Leonard to try them. <laughs> we got um, some of our sports rec people that were like, not for me. <laughs> uh, but it was just that experience and those kids remember that. Um, and that was a recipe that I got from that, that walk with Jennifer and it, was, it just really uh, sparked my interest. And so if you know me, I get really excited about a lot of things, <laughs> but I think that helps getting that information across, like getting those people interested too. And once that's sparked, then they can go do their own um, research too. And I'm hoping that this is just one more way that I can get our community engaged in our traditional foods. We've done it with Camas, we've done it with salmon, we've done it with um, our game meats and things like that. So this is just one more avenue to just really get that engagement with our community and make us feel like we are connected to our ancestors. We do, we eat, so my job is called the traditional food medicine. I hate that word. <laughs> I'm like, this is who we are. This is what we do. This isn't traditional. This is what we're doing now. So I just haven't come up with a cool enough term to change it officially yet. <laughs> but um, so that's my, my hope for this project is, or for kelp coming back is just another learning experience for our people. Thanks. Uh, these women obviously know a lot more about uh, their tribe's cultural uses of kelp and seaweed, and so I won't go down that road. Um, but, uh, you know, I am the scientist, and so I will talk a little bit about natural resources, uh, perspective on kelp. Um, of course, we're very interested, Squaxin's very interested in aquaculture. Um, there's a long tradition of uh, aquacultural practices in tribal country. And uh, we've been involved in shellfish and finfish, and we're looking to move into the uh, seaweed space and see how we can uh, integrate that into some of our other programs. But I'd like to specifically talk about the, the natural uh, bed at Squaxin Island. Um, it's uh, southernmost bed in uh, Puget Sound, at the head of the Sound. And uh, it's in a lot of trouble. It's been on a long-term decline. And then uh, we've experienced just recently a short-term disaster. It's in serious shape, and it's hard to say what exactly the reason for that is. Um, we've got lots of people helping us on this. We're looking to repopulate that bed. Uh, Betsy, Tom, you know, we've got lots of people contributing to the effort, and we really appreciate that. Um, we've invited them to the island to the reservation. Uh, we consider that bed to be on reservation. Um, one thing that I would point to, and there's been a little bit of talk today about temperature and, uh, and kelp, and 
when we had this um, disaster I'm describing, I went back and looked at the uh, temperature records, uh, the water temperature records from the uh, heat dome event. I'm sure many of you uh, remember that. And the temperature measurements that we, uh, we were able to log at Squawks and Island for that month were three degrees warmer than the 10-year average. I mean, it was a big event in terms of us, people, air temperature, but three degrees in the marine environment is pretty significant. Can't say that was the reason for our short-term disaster, but we need to keep keep looking at it. We've got also, though, the long-term decline of the bed. I mean, this bed has been in trouble before the heat dome. And, you know, one of the things that I look at is the fact that there's, uh, we, we don't have a lot of urchins in South Puget Sound, um, but we do have kelp crabs. And they're, they're just all over it. They're eating it down, you know, day by day through its growth cycle. And there's no natural predator working on those kelp crabs um, because, perhaps because uh, we don't have a sufficient rockfish population. How many people know that there are multiple species of rockfish in Puget Sound that are listed on the Endangered Species Act? Raise your hand. Well, that's... That's good. A lot of you are aware of that. And it's, it's a significant effect in this kind of ecological situation where there's nothing to eat the kelp crabs. So where have the rockfish gone? I don't know. The fishery's been gone for decades. Um, and I can't help but look at uh, what could be eating the fish is uh, where is the system out of whack? Well, we've got this gross overpopulation of marine mammals, seals in particular, seals and sea lions, pinnipeds. Um, something's eating those baby rockfish. They're never surviving to eat the kelp crabs. So that's the way, uh, that's the situation we're dealing with, and we're trying to figure that out. There's uh, still a lot of work to be done. Um, <clears throat> so the relationship with uh, kelp, you know, Skokomish is primarily a, um, a fin fish culture, like salmon culture, and, you know, the, um, the decline of salmon that's been experienced in the region, you know, has um, forced a lot of the, their cultural um, sustenance to really shift to shellfish, but there's really, uh, you know, anything that supports fish Salmon, anything, you know, the biodiversity associated with kelp is, is really important to the, to the tribe. And, you know, if you look at the historical records of the Hood Canal, um, most of the kelp is uh, going to be at the very northern range of the Hood Canal. Uh, it's, it's a very warm water body. So, um, you know, even the earliest, earliest maps that, have, that I've ever seen of, of where those, the distribution of kelp is, really it's in the very upper, upper portion um, near Hood Head where the current... Um, John Davis's farm is, and um, you know, right where the Hood Canal Bridge is, actually was a, was a bed right there. Um, so really the reliance that the tribe had on is very much in terms of the, the ecological benefit that the kelp beds provided in terms of biodiversity and just the, um, a refuge, you know, as, as migrating salmon move back and forth between um, the Skokomish River and, and the other rivers, Quilcene River and the various other rivers of the, of the Hood Canal. Um, and, you know, I think that, that probably would summarize the main um, historical knowledge that I'm aware of that the Skokomish has relied on those, those kelp beds. And um, the people that I've talked to typically don't have a lot of memory of physical, the physical structures of the, the kelp beds because of that northern range um, that they existed in. All right, well, thank you all so much for, yeah, that really important information. Um, we're gonna go to the next question. So what comes to your mind when you hear the term seaweed aquaculture? 
So when I hear the term seaweed aquaculture, I think about partnership with the land. I also think about how aquaculture has been in my veins for at least seven generations. My grandmother was just recollecting how fisher women in my family, we've been, fisher women have been around for at least seven generations. Not me, it goes through my sister now. Uh, I tend, I'm stuck at a desk and I'm, I get seasick really easy, so. <laughs> It's really weird to be Indian and have be seasick. Anyways, I'm also allergic to shellfish. Man, strike two. Oh, I know, I know. <laughs> but I, I can still help from a policy level. I can still help at the advocacy level. And so when my dad was in aquaculture, far, he, farming was just a no-brainer. It was just a no-brainer because I, we actually have photos of my, my great, great, great-grandfather off of Indian Island near Port Townsend, if anyone's familiar with that area. I have a picture of the Prince of Wales uh, and his wife and then his, a couple of his children. They're out there in the clamming beds. We were farming. We farmed for, for clams, oysters, we gooey duck, gosh, uh, urchin, seaweed. Like we, we farmed it all. So it was just a natural next step, and now we're just adding Western science to it. So we're working on uh, seaweed aquaculture at Jamestown. I mentioned a little bit of that, the example earlier. We're doing surveys. We're trying, we're trying out some seeding out there. I don't even know if I'm using the right term. See, this is where I, non-science person. But I think you understand where I'm, what I'm talking about. But we want to try out net pens, things like that, and make sure that kelp and seaweed are a part of all of that. So for me, it's just a natural piece of the culture and uh, just trying to blend the new science and the new methods with it. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I think that when I think of aquaculture, I think a, a little bit more of that ground level stuff, like from our growing up with my grandpa who dug clams with a straight fork, <laughs> um, to my great grandma who had, and my cousin Jay Mills will tell, tells the story beautifully about my great grandmother who had a patch a patch down below her house where that was her patch. And if you got caught catching clam or digging clams in her patch, you were in trouble. Um, I consider that aquaculture. I think that was, you know, she was getting up in age. My grandpa, my great grandpa had passed away already. She was on her own feeding a bunch of kids. So that was her way of ensuring that she could go get those clams later. Um, that to me is aquaculture. This, this whole new stuff with growing kelp and farms and things like that, I'm, it's all, it's a, it's a pre precipice for me. Like I'm just getting to the beginning of learning and understanding that part of it. Um, so I'm really glad to be in conversations right now about it. Um, but when I think of aquaculture, I think of those ground zero level um, where we started from and where we're getting to now. It's not the same, you know, we've got equipment as, as in, you know, indigenous people, we're always stepping up. Like, we'll, if we have a, prob, a project, we'll figure out how to get it done. If we have to upgrade our tools, we'll upgrade our tools. That's just, this is another step in that. We're upgrading our systems to maybe do it a little bit more efficiently, maybe a little bit more, and do more for the environment than just this one thing, you know. It's not just food it's for us, it's food for the environment. It's cleaning this, you know. So that's what I'm thinking. When I hear seaweed aquaculture, I go, oh, goody. <laughs> <laughs> More to work with. Uh, like I said, the, the tribes have been uh, long term in cultural practices for uh, the marine environment. Um, You've, I'm sure you've heard stories about uh, clam gardens, and uh, you know we probably have heard that tribes used to uh, put fur boughs in the water to supplement the forage fish spawn. Yeah, you know, th there's all kinds of practices out there that are traditional for tribes, and Squaxin has seized on those. Uh, like I said, living in the marine environment that they do, they are known as people of the water, and they have been involved in cultural practices for fish uh, for literally decades. Um, 
we were probably the first net pens in Puget Sound. And um, we grow gooey duck, we grow clams, we grow oysters. You know, there's all kinds of uh, aquaculture that the tribe's involved in. And so it just is a natural step to uh, proceed into the uh, seaweed environment. It's all part of the system. You know, everything's connected. I've, I've heard some of the math today, and, and, you know, I don't dispute it, but, you know, people have said, well, you know, you couldn't possibly offset all the carbon you need to offset by growing seaweed. Okay, fine. But that's not the only thing involved here. It's connected to all these other pieces, whether it's habitat, um, community commitment, just involvement with the environment, reteaching the younger generations the, the ways of old. There's all these parts to the equation that you've got to filter into this consideration of aquaculture. And, you know, I think Squaxin does a good job of that. And, you know, they may not be able to change the world with what they do, but they can change their neighborhood. Um, the term aquaculture, you know, I've spent quite a bit of time thinking about the term aquaculture. Um, you know, kind of learning how land-based large microalgal facilities operate in large ponds, quarter acre ponds, and looking at production, grams per square meter per day. And then, you know, getting involved in uh, shellfish farms and, you know, bag cultures, flip bags, and, you know, the various gear associated with that. And then and then learning, you know, to, to manage natural populations, um, getting involved in enhancement efforts, seeding, seeding oysters, seeding, seeding clams, um, you know, and then, and then it's like, well, which part of that do we call aquaculture? You know, the, the human engagement with the, um, with the resource to, to plant, um, you know, seed out into the water system that grows, is it the, is it the, which aspect is it really that would define that term? Is it, do we need a, a, a bag to put the oyster in to call it aquaculture? Or if I just put it on the beach and let it grow, is that aquaculture? Um, I don't know if I have really good clarity of that. You know, there's sort of different degrees of intensity and different degrees of, of equipment that's needed. Um, you know, even, you know, one could argue that restoring some of these natural river systems that have salmon spawning grounds could be considered a form of aquaculture or human engagement with, with the marine species, um, hatcheries. So, you know, there's a lot of confusion that I have in that regard, um, you know, and, and, but, I, but I think that the process of growing food in the water, you know, is something that's essential to, to Skokomish and to, um, to, to the tribes of the region, really. Um, no, nope, my daughter's calling there. <laughs> um, yeah, that's a, that's sort of the the thoughts of aquaculture, you know, and um, the the various forms, and and some interact with uh, practices that um, Skokomish is, is ongoing practices Skokomish has of the water body in different ways that that others don't. Um, uh, but I think that might be our next question, so I won't jump this. <laughs> <laughs> All right, wonderful. Um, any other follow-ups to that, or should we go on to the next question? That was great, you guys. All right, wonderful. All right, our next question. Um, what would you like prospective Washington seaweed farmers to know before they pursue a permit? Ooh, okay. I had two thoughts. The first would be that I would ask any prospective seaweed farmer to, how do I say it? Acknowledge that 
your farm might be ancestral territory of a tribe. Um, maybe the tribe doesn't own it anymore, that land, but maybe you do um, because that's legal now. And so if you're going to farm on that land, think of, I would love for that farmer to think about what we do to the land. We, we were here to, we have a sacred duty to steward the land. So I ask that any prospective farmer would think about that and do good work on the land uh, with good heart and with good intention. Uh, the second thought I have is, hey, think about if there's a potential for partnership with the local tribe in your area. You know, maybe the tribe doesn't have a space for seaweed farming itself, and so they might partner with you. Maybe explore those types of options. That's my two. So I was thinking about it uh, a little, again, with the ancestral lands. But what we, what our tr treaties say is that we have usual and custom areas for our fishermen. And so a big thing about where are these going to go? Are these going to be right in the middle of our crabbers, crabbing grounds? Like those things, those, that's where it's going to get tricky with these permitting issues, I think, is that you're going to need, you have to work with the tribes because you can't just plop your farm right in the middle of this grounds where they've been crabbing for hundreds of years. Like it, I think that's where it's going to get tricky. Thanks. Uh, permitting is an interesting question, and I know, uh, I know Blair's going to go into some of the details of uh, some of the permits that relate to tribes, but I think you need to be aware that um, it's a complicated situation out there, despite the characterization of, of co-management. Um, the, the lawsuits have been specifically about fish and shellfish and more recently about culverts, but I'll tell you, there are multiple state agencies out there that refuse to consider co-management of all resources for, for tribes. Um, you know, a good example would be water. Uh, you know, Squawks Nine and Tribe, people of the water, uh, state won't recognize the tribe as a co-manager of water. Um, so the tribes have to address their concerns in, in other ways, and that is what can get complicated. But what would I advise specifically, um, kind of reiterate the point, location, location, location. <laughs> You know, Squaxin is, uh, I hope I've conveyed that Squaxin is very favorable toward aquaculture. But you go and propose uh, a farm in the wrong location, and the wrong location would be like, you know, a drift reach for the gill netters. The fishers, we don't distinguish, we just call them all fishers. <laughs> The fishers would be pretty upset if you took away a, a, a drift. Yeah. And, um, and they can affect an outcome if that conflict arises. I would also point to, uh, we work pretty closely with uh, Taylor Shellfish um, in our neck of the woods. Right now, Taylor is proposing a large uh, floating shellfish nursery in Oakland Bay. And um, they've been working with us, they've been talking with us, and they are designing that facility such that if the tribe needed to launch a fishery in that location, they could detach their nursery and tow it out of the way. You just got to work with us. Um, yeah, I mean to reiterate, you know, early early connections with the with the tribe that's you know has UNA in the area that you're proposing a a farm is critical. Um, you know, at Skokomish, it's I, I'm not in the department that reviews those permits, but the permits do come through, and and um, I'll be, you know, oftentimes in discussion with the people that are going through that review process. Um, 
And you know, one of the considerations that's very, very relevant is, um, you know, the the water body. You know, if we talk about Hood Canal, there's there's a lot of production that comes out of out of the water body, in the form of you know, all the various species, uh, whether it be the salmon that come up the rivers, but also the crab or the shrimp and the oysters, the clams, and the gooey duck. And if you tally it all together, that's, that's a lot of production that comes out of the natural system. And so when there's a, um, an installation of something that could potentially impact that production, um, you know, it's the responsibility of the tribe to, just, to, to make sure that the, the production that's already taking place isn't going to be impacted, uh, whether that be putting a, you know, a, a um, floating aquaculture system on top of a recovering gooey duck bed. I mean, these gooey duck beds are, the estimate right now is 55 years to be, you know, recovered from a, a harvest, which could take, you know, the harvest could be open for a decade, two decades, and then it'll be 55 years to recover. So someone might go, hey, there's nothing here, but in reality, it's year 20 of a recovery cycle. Um, so those are, you know, a lot of the thought processes that go through, you know, the office of how, you know, what's the tribe's position on this, as well as whether it's an area that, that does have active fisheries, as um, Jeff mentioned about, you know, that that is a very um, important aspect to the to the Skokomish is, is making sure that they can um, fish in their usual areas and the places they've been fished for generations. And um, but yeah, so early early connections and and um, you know thinking of it in terms of partnerships of how to. Um, you know, accomplish one's goal so that so that both parties would be beneficiary beneficiaries of that installation would be an important aspect. All right. Well, wonderful. You give, please go ahead. I I just wanted to dive a little bit deeper on on the permitting. Um, it's really interesting. One of the critical permits I'm sure you're aware of is the Army Corps of Engineers, and a, a number of years ago. Um, up in Suquamish territory, uh, there was a, a marina permit that the Army Corps issued, and uh, it was in a fishing space, and it was litigated, and the Corps lost. The interesting thing about the Army Corps is once you tell them what to do, they will do it. So when they were told by the courts, you've got to honor tribal fishing rights, they do. And so when it comes to permitting, if a tribe stands up and objects to a permit, the Army Corps says to the proponent, you need to work with the tribe. We're not gonna issue that permit until you resolve that issue. And you've seen that to this day from everything from mooring buoys to the coal terminal up in North Puget Sound. The Corps is a pretty powerful advocate for respecting treaty rights. Uh, one of the things we've observed a lot, you know, there's a lot of uh, oyster farms and shellfish permits that go through into the, in the Hood Canal. And, um, you know, I, I, in general, I get the sense that the, that the group here today is sort of the front of a of a larger group that would be applying for permits and and so everyone here seems to be very like here's what we're going to do and they and they have best intentions there's there's other people that we deal with routinely in the hook canal that are not as such they um you know will land on somebody's property and take all the oysters and then the, you know we get a call from someone taking all the oysters and it's like well okay there's a lot of nefarious actors there's also a lot of um, somebody will get a permit for one thing, and then decades later, you know, they're up for renewal, and we look at it, and we're like, you were permitted for something completely different, and now you're doing this. And so we're gonna hold you accountable, and, that, and, and so that, and that happens. And it's, um, you know, so just being aware that there's, there's this reality when you've been operating in the same place for a long time, there's a memory there that can, um, not make sense all the time for those that are sort of fresh, you know, like, what's the objection to this? This is a good activity, and it might be. But, it, but you know, 
right behind the door is this other person that, that totally took advantage of, a, of an opportunity and did something completely different than what their permit um, was authorized for. And then in that same light, if, if one finds they want to add multi-trophic species and add other components to, the, to their permit, you know, it's always totally a, a fine to update the permit, go through the process again. And that is a form of communication that will notify the tribes that, hey, there's proposing a modification to this. So that's an evaluation period. You know, a lot of times the permits form this channel of communication between all the different stakeholders. That's a really important, important part of the permit, you know, understanding that it, that it adds a huge amount of complication and, and cost and labor and, and, and all those various functions. But the communication aspect is, is really, really important to make sure that everybody's aligned with what's happening and has the chance to review it. All right, any final thoughts on that question? Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you guys so much. We actually have a little over 10 minutes for questions. So, <laughs> so if people do want to come up to the mic, if you have questions, please feel free. I also have one question here, so I'll get started with this. And if others want to come up to the mic, please do. Um, how can prospective seaweed farmers work collaboratively with tribes to further develop social license for growing food in the water? <laughs> well, uh, no, I, I think you actually spoke to it. I mean, partner, come talk with us. We're interested. And, you know, there's, there's opportunity out there. We, we all have an interest in this. And despite the fact that there's one state agency in the state of Washington that seems to think that they are the czar of all aquaculture and they're not working with anybody. Um, we actually want to work with everybody. So just yes. come and talk to us. Uh, social license for growing food in the water. I mean, obviously food is growing in the water. So, you know, one of the other, other things that, that has struck me listening to a lot of the discussions within the, the office in, in Skokomish as, as things have come through is that there's a long memory of the various attempts to do floating aquaculture in the, in the region. So if you go back, you know, the fish farms were installed. There was a push for that, but in the, I don't know, 70s or so before I was around. But then, and then there's a lot of mussel farms a decade or two ago. And um, so I think it's a really important concept to have examples at work. Here's Here's a floating kelp farm that produces this. We could look at the impacts it has this. You know, that type of, of information is critical for people who are going to evaluate it. And so that there's the, the scaling, you know, as, as Joth mentioned earlier, when things scale, they have to have smaller footprints to show that what the potential impacts would be. And then as, the, as things move along, then things can get bigger. But if one was to just install something large and have the impacts unknown, that's a risk to those that are relying on that on those resources um, for their cultural heritage and their sustenance and their economic viability. If I'm understanding social license correctly, uh, reputation matters when it comes to tribes and partnerships. Uh, so Jamestown is a really great example of this. We partnered with Cook Aquaculture for our, for our programs. Wasn't a great reputation at the time with the Atlantic salmon net pens that uh, broke apart, right? But we spent hours and hours in a contract negotiation discussion measuring the social capital of the tribe in dollars. What a weird conversation to have. What is my social capital and my reputation as a tribal government worth in this greater community as I'm gonna be pushing aquaculture forward, maybe into a community that is not quite favorable or not quite um, educated fully on what our, what, like what's our goals with aquaculture? What's our goals with Cook Aquaculture as a partner? So it, uh, when we're talking about building that social capital, it's going to depend on are you a newer farmer trying to build reputation? Well, then let's, let's have those really, really early initial conversations together. We'll tell you what we want to see so that we can be that partner with you. If you're already established like Cook or maybe Taylor Shellfish, something else like that, well, we check out the historical reputation. And so even though Jamestown, 
doesn't whether you guys agree with us or not on why we partnered and you know were they the right partner we chose yes um, and because we were studying that reputation and we studied what they did we studied their family what their values were and it, it matched up with us enough to where we said yes and so then we went forward from there on what does that reputation mean what does that contract and that partnership look like I hope that makes sense Okay, I'm seeing lots of head nods, great. <laughs> All right, um, I thought I saw you first. If you wanna come up here and ask your question, that would be great. Do these work now? Yes. Okay. All right, cool. All right, I'm gonna yeah, I'm gonna <laughs> uh, Hi, yeah, so I'm Zach Paiga. I'm trying to start a, set, a uh, kelp farm up in San Juan Islands. And so I'm curious, like, it's uh, cool that you've mentioned partnering, because what is the best way as like an outsider to establish an equitable partnership with the local traps and like get them to actually respond to your emails? Relationship building, you know, so how do you build relationships with people that um, are not responding. Uh, you go to where they are, you know, yeah. whether it be, you know, conferences like this or other conferences, or, you know, you, you, you just start learning about them and you listen to what they have to say about the area. And the more you listen, the more that they feel that they're heard and, that, that, and respected, I think the better chance you have of having a response email. <laughs> and, and learn about who they are before you try to make too many attempts to outreach. The reason I say this is, you know, recognize that each tribe is this sovereign nation. And guess what? They don't all hold the same view. Right. <laughs> <laughs> they have many different views. And embedded in that is the fact that different tribes have different legal rights. And, you know, for people outside of tribal country, that gets real complicated real quickly. They don't understand it. They don't figure, they can't understand why they call one tribe and they get an answer and they call another tribe and they found out, you talk with them, we're not talking to you. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. You, you have to kind of learn that landscape before you get too far down the road. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> All right, wonderful. I, we have our next question from you here. You want to give your name and your question, would be great. Um, Jackie Dexter with Hold Fast Mary Culture, Future Kelp and Blue Muscle Farm in Whatcom County. And as I'm beginning the permitting process, uh, there's five tribes that I'm hoping to appease to and, and permit through, but I recognize that all tribes have UNA in the state, and I'm wondering if other tribes would appreciate that line of communication early on as well, that maybe don't um, utilize those grounds, but let's have those partnerships and communications, and I don't know how much further south I need to go, because I'm up by Canada. Yeah, well, it, Similar to what I just said, UNA is not the same everywhere. Right. Yeah. Tribes have overlapping UNAs. There are things called primary UNAs and secondary UNAs. There's tribes that could, their members could legally fish in a location, but only if they were invited by the local tribe to fish there. So UNA is not just one thing, it's complicated as well. And, um, you know, in the case of location, I, I mean, I don't think you need to talk about what you're doing with the Squaxin Island Tribe if you're doing it in Clallam County. But on the other hand, there's fish management decisions that go on up in, you know, Area 8, Area 9 that Squawkson has an interest in and a role in, and so, you know, things get complicated, and you, <laughs> there's no I'll easy send you answer. Six point three notice of intent. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'll just quickly follow. I mean, 
Jeff said it. I, if there's something going on outside of my UNA, I feel like the, tri the tribe of that UNA would not appreciate me getting in their business. Okay, I'm getting some head nods, yeah. <laughs> so I, I guess I'm just saying, if you're doing something outside of Jamestown's UNA, like you're up in Whatcom County, that's not us, um, then we, we, might, we might just notice from far away and see what's going on, but we won't officially comment or anything like that, because it's just not our area. All right, wonderful. Uh, Nicole, you want to ask your question. Uh, so I'm Nicole Nara with Washington Sea Grant. Um, first, thank you all so much for being here today and sharing your um, knowledge and wisdom with us. Um, I really enjoyed hearing about um, some of the stories about how some of your ancestors um, practiced aquaculture. Um, and it reminded me of something that I've learned as an anthropologist, um, thinking about terrestrial uh, ecosystems. We distinguish between horticulture, which is, for anthropologists, small-scale, biodiverse systems um, that are usually pretty sustainable and practice primarily for subsistence. And that we contrast with agriculture, large-scale, technologically intensive crops, mostly for commercial purposes. And I was wondering if you all thought that like, a term like marine horticulture would be something useful to add to this conversation about what aquaculture is, or if you think that would just make things more confusing. Go ahead, go on. Like, I'm a non scientist, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> so, I have a concern, a frustration perhaps, um, embedded in, in what you said and, and how you, the distinction you made, and, and that was the use of the term commercial. Um, and, you know, it also goes to my frustration with the aforementioned state agency who's trying to ban commercial fish farming. It's like, what's commercial? I mean, I'm not the lawyer here, but it seems to me you, you've got a pretty fuzzy line as to what may or may not be commercial. And if, if I were growing, if I created a, a kelp farm purely for restoration activities to provide habitat or whatnot, but you know, at some point I needed to harvest the kelp to remove say, carbon from the water column, can I sell it? Is that commercial? There was, it's not an industrial operation, but is it commercial? So I, I hope everybody thinks about the terminology a little bit, and uh, as far as horticulture, agriculture, I don't know, just mariculture. <laughs> covers everything. <laughs> In brief, I would say from a cultural standpoint, uh, terms like that, we have our we have our own words. So at least in in my cultural when I wear my cultural hat, I'm a ceremonial leader as well. We just we have our own words, so I wouldn't use terms like that. Um, every one of our brothers and sisters in creation has its own name. But then underneath all of that, they're just underneath this umbrella of Shetung you know, the land, the living land, or the living sea, the living waters, living skies. Um, so if those terms, I, I will just say, like, we adapt, tribes adapt to the terms that come, up, come along. And so if that is something that is, comes along in our, in our daily work, we will find a way to adapt to it and retranslate it into our own indigenous terms. But you probably won't hear a lot of us on the tribal lands use it, just from a cultural standpoint. All right, that actually brings us to time, but I wanna allow you guys any closing remarks, if you have anything that you wanna say, just as a last 30 seconds or a minute <laughs> to share, it's entirely up to you. <laughs> uh, just briefly touching on that. <clears throat> When I was talking about this uh, project earlier, the term farm and restoration came up. And I was like, I thought they were the same thing. 
Like, aren't we, are we after the same thing? So just that's something that I'm going to go back and think about. And that kind of fits with what she was saying about the horticulture versus agriculture. Kind of like where I sit with that. Like, I'm, that's some research that I want to do to see where I sit with that. I want to just comment on, and say what, uh, or refer to what Lonnie just said, that they have different words. So recognize that, yes, we're all speaking English, but it's different cultures. I figure that, like I said, I've been working on the tribe for 36 years. I figured it took me a good five or six years working there every day before I started to understand. That's my tip. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, you know, the, I think, you know, food production is important just in general and, and using the water body for food production in the terms of aquaculture or whatnot. I think, you know, like it's, it's an easy concept and I get a lot of frustrations if we're not doing it where it's like if we're harvesting it, there has to be some of that it's to, to put back, you know, that, that concept of, of putting back what was taken and, and seeding. Um, and, and if we go for a period of time without seeding beaches, people are, you know, feel the frustrations, you know, and what we term that, I, you know, I don't know, but it's, but it's a, you know, um, using the, using the water for food production for, for human consumption and human cultural, um, you know, representation. I think it's, it's, a, it's an important, important thing. And, and engaging early, again, that's really, you know, learning the, the tribes that are, that are active in the area, that have jurisdiction for the particular spot that you happen to be a proponent of uh, putting in, a, you know, some type of farm, uh, what's going to serve you the best to start learning those tribes and getting in touch with them early. Last word. <laughs> tribes are ancient people, and then we're also forever people. So we'll be here. We'll be here with the land because that was what the Creator told us to do. Be here, steward the land, steward the seas. Um, and so we just continue to evolve with what's going on around us. And now with you know climate change as an example, you know that's that's a new thing. We now we have a different type of protection and stewarding that we have to do. And um, you know trying to figure out what do we do with kelp as it's declining? How do we help it? You know. So I guess my just leaving you with we're an ancient people, we're a forever people. But I'm really glad I have partners like you all out there to help me with the science, to help me with different perspectives, to help me with resources, different tools, different ways of thinking, different ways of trying to problem solve and brainstorm. We need everybody, our land and our seas, our air, we need everybody. So I'm just grateful for that partnership with you all too. Thank you. All right, thank you everybody so much. All right. <laughs>
okay, I think this thing has to get out of the way, and then we do a slideshow and its presenter view. Okay, I'm gonna put this way down here. Okay. Yes, there you go. I don't think I have much in the way of notes, but we'll see. Yeah, I can bring you a cup of water if you like. Yeah, that'd be good. Thanks. You want me to just start now, or should we wait? Okay. All right. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Chris Erdley. I'm with uh, Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. A disclaimer, I spend most of my time thinking about shellfish, um, but I do think about kelp, seaweeds, a little bit, increasingly so. And uh, I've appreciated that everyone that has come up to talk today has had their own kind of seaweed story, and so I feel um, compelled to uh, uh, admit something, a bit of a confession. Thanks. Um, I, was, I was like scared of seaweed <laughs> until I was like 10. <laughs> Just terrified, because I mean, who knows what's in there, you know? <laughs> and why does it feel like that? <laughs> so, when we were kids, nobody wanted to swim over the, the spots that had seaweed, the dark spots, or paddle over them, like there's seaweed monsters in there. So, um, so this is a bit of a, a therapeutic opportunity for me. Um, now, I, now I love seaweed. Um, definitely have uh, grown out of it, so no worries. All right, did that advance? Good. Okay, so I've been invited to talk today about agency perspective, regulatory uh, perspective, which of course is like the best thing to talk about at four o'clock after a long day. <laughs> so I'll try, to, I'll try to keep it light, I'll try to be efficient. Uh, so, so first, just to set the stage, and a lot of what I'm gonna say today reflects a bit of what we've already heard, which is great. Um, Betsy introduced this morning that there's a lot of complexity in how seaweed aquaculture is regulated in our state, besides the federal level um, and the, the tribal agency involvement as, that we've heard so much about as well. There's also a number of state agencies that have roles and interests, local entities as well. I don't list them all here, but a, a couple that we connect with commonly in our relatively narrowly defined role at Fish and Wildlife um, include DNR, Natural Resources, and uh, the Department of Agriculture. Within our agency, we have several programs that have an interest in seaweeds and seaweed aquaculture, wildlife, habitat program, a fish program, which is my larger program, and then zooming in, um, our individual shop, the Puget Sound Shellfish Unit, which is what I'll spend most of uh, today talking about. So, I put this in here thinking, oh, I'm gonna come into this room and it's gonna be all shellfish people. And there's a few shellfish people, but it's actually really great that most of this room is new faces to me um, coming in to talk about seaweed. So many of you are familiar with our role in permitting shellfish movements. Um, we have responsibility to manage risks of introducing and spreading pathogens and harmful pests into and around our state. We do this via permitting, among other things. Many of you are familiar with that. We have an import permit, a transfer permit. All of our permits are conditioned to um, address, address risk, mitigate risk, and make sure that things are done in ways that um, hopefully are, are smart and low risk. And in so doing, we think about uh, disease, but also, as we heard earlier, we're interested in potential genetic risks as well. I'm not gonna bore you too much with this texty slide other than to say, um, you know, our, some of our key authorities discuss that we will regulate uh, movements of seaweeds around the state and that we'll develop a, a program of disease control. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out is we have a lot of direction and, and commentary in our statutes and our rules that link us to DNR and Department of Agriculture and that we'll work with them in uh, developing our policies. Our rules are, again, aimed at managing disease risks and pest risks, and um, this uh, messy slide here is meant to pick that, hey, 
These are issues in other places where seaweed is cultivated. Okay? This is probably not news to a lot of you, but in many places, the impacts are substantial. We're talking nine-figure um, nine figure losses on an annual basis in some places, substantial chunks of annual production, multiple species affected, diseases, harmful epiphytes, and others. And the other thing I wanted to point out, as we heard in, in a panel earlier um, that my colleague Katie sat on, is we don't have a great understanding of everything that's out there. Uh, the pace at which um, novel pathogens have been characterized and, and defined in recent years has been rapid because we don't know a whole lot. There's a lot of opportunity there to, to learn more. And biosecurity is underdeveloped globally and nationally. Um, there's no good international standards, for example, for reporting uh, disease issues, for, uh, for filling in all the details in diagnostic. Katie already mentioned earlier, there's limited diagnostic expertise and capacity available. This is something we've struggled with um, somewhat recently in some of our decision making. I want to ask you to read this, um, but focus on the, the arrows, the colors, and the blocks. The, the arrows denote um, movements of materials for seaweed aquaculture that have occurred in other regions. Uh, the colors, notably red, is where non-native seaweed species have been introduced as a result of some of these movements from areas uh, where they're native, being uh, the blue colors. And the boxes denote major disease or epiphyte outbreaks, uh, some of which have been linked directly to those movements and some of which would be, um, you know, conjecture, uh, but certainly of concern. So the point here is concurrent with movement of seaweeds comes risk of moving harmful organisms as well. Um, so our, our rules focus on trying to manage those risks. Um, we also, as we discussed earlier in, in a panel today, think a little bit about potential genetic risks. So I think we talked about earlier that cultivation of seaweeds in our state is likely to be native species. Again, thinking about risks of introducing a harmful non-native. Um, we, we talked earlier about there being some understanding and evidence of population structure in some species and that there has been some evidence of um, anthropogenic influence on genetic structure in other regions. So we certainly want to be very careful and about everything that we do. It doesn't mean that we're going to uh, stand in the way. It just means we want to make sure this is part of the conversation and that we're smart about decisions that we make as, as this group um, pursues seaweed aquaculture uh, in the state. So on to what we have in place for existing rules, and I'll comment um, maybe on the next slide on a question that Tom had up in uh, a panel earlier today asking whether what's in place in our state is adequate. Um, we have a requirement to register as aquatic farmer for anyone cultivating uh, shellfish, fish, seaweed. Um, again, most of these rules are aimed at disease control. If we can understand what's being cultivated where, we can make decisions on responding to disease issues and managing risk. Um, I won't get too much more into that. There's a seaweed import permit requirement and a seaweed transfer permit requirement, all with our agency. Because um, I'm short on time, I'll try to blast through these next two. Uh, in managing seaweed, you know, it's, it's very unlike other taxa that we regulate. And so we're constantly dealing with new questions that we don't know how to answer, right? And uh, sometimes it takes us some time, and sometimes the answers themselves are a little bit unusual. Uh, so that's one limitation. Another one is uh, because we don't feel like we have the tools, the capacity to adequately assess risk, um, especially related with imports, we're currently not permitting imports. Um, there, there are no facilities out of state that are approved by us to provide seed material in state. Um, we think that is the best way to manage risk given the uncertainty, and we think that the best outcome for seaweed aquaculture in our state is that facilities develop in our state that can provide that material um, locally, at least for now. The shellfish transfer permit requirement, you know, I think it, these rules were developed quite some time ago. I think given what, what we know now about disease issues and managing those risks and even some of the genetic pieces that our current uh, requirement, which stipulates that you need a permit for moving between really big basins, the ocean and Puget Sound. Um, 
you know, the Columbia River area and Puget Sound, rather than other, you know, finer scale uh, geographies, maybe is not is not really adequate. And so, I would suspect that we'd be having conversations in the future, including with many in this room, about what the, the next uh, iteration of that might look like. Finally. Uh, some other considerations for us at Fish and Wildlife, and, and we heard um, Blair mentioned a bit about this in, in uh, the previous session, and as well as uh, uh, some of the other folks throughout the day and in the previous session, but we're, we have questions about, or concerns about potential conflict with existing uses, like fishing, gooey duck beds, um, mo being able to monitor those areas and conduct uh, management activities, both us and with our co-managers. Um, potential conflict with recreational fisheries and public access. And so when we get applications you know, passed on to us through the Army Corps of Engineers, we're likely to comment on some of these things. Again, doesn't mean necessarily we're seeking to, to stand in the way, but it just these are the things we want to be part of the conversation. Um, finally, I, I'll mention that some of those other programs within my department have commented and have questions on potential marine mammal interactions, shading of, of the benthos, um, inputs to the benthos, impacts from anchoring, herring spawn. These are all things we already heard about today. Emily did a great job presenting these earlier. Um, and these are all areas that I'll pose our uh, needs for exploration. So that's it for me. Here's our website. It has uh, everything that you need to know on there. And if there's something that you need an answer on, reach out to us. You know, it's our job to be thinking about seaweed health issues all day long. So give us a shout. Thank you, Chris. I'm. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry that. Oh yeah. Well, you, you can sit for a bit. Here's your lemonade, at any rate. All right, Brady. I think you're just ready to, ready go. to go. Okay. I won't take forward. your time. Okay. Yeah. Um, good afternoon. My name is Brady Scott. I'm a, an assistant division manager with uh, DNR Aquatic Resources Division. Uh, my area of focus is the management of state owned aquatic land throughout the Orca Straits District, which covers the eight northwest counties. But my team also focuses um, on aquaculture throughout Puget Sound, so primarily uh, through uh, leasing and stewardship and restoration. Um, at DNR, you'll often hear us talk about the phrase um, state owned aquatic lands understanding what state-owned aquatic lands are and how and for what purpose they are managed is important to uh, the seaweed aquaculture industry. Uh, upon statehood, the, uh, uh, under the equal footing doctrine and per Article um, 17 of the Washington State Constitution, Washington asserted ownership to the beds and shores of all navigable waters in the state. And with that, all the tidelands and shorelands and bedlands um, became state-owned aquatic lands. And then between statehood and up until the 19, 1950s, many of those um, tidelands and shorelands were actually sold into private ownership. That was to support economic development, including the aquaculture industry. In the 1950s, that trend shifted to leasing aquatic lands. And it was uh, the importance of retaining ownership um, by the people of the state was being more and more recognized. And then in 1971, the legislature passed the Aquatic Lands Act, and that eliminated the sale of aquatic lands in Washington. So today, the uh, state manages approximately 2.6 million acres. That includes approximately 30% of tidelands, 70% of shorelands, and virtually all the bedlands, um, which were received at statehood. So these uh, now state-owned aquatic lands, uh, the remaining um, aquatic lands in the state um, that weren't sold are managed by the Department of Natural Resources under the administration of the Commissioner of Public Lands. So uh, DNR is a little unique and essentially it acts as a property manager uh, that manages um, these state-owned aquatic lands on behalf of the citizens of the state. Uh, the legislature has recognized that these state, um, these state aquatic lands uh, are a finite natural resource of great value and irreplaceable public heritage. I think we've learned a lot about that today, um, especially on the, the last panel. 
As a steward of the 2.6 million acres of state-owned aquatic land, the legislature has directed DNR to consider the natural values and best use of these lands before authorizing for um, commercial and other purposes. These decisions um, must also follow the um, broad aquatic, man aquatic land management guidelines listed up here. Uh, we often refer to these guidelines as the, the four plus one were to uh, encourage um, public use and access to the state-owned aquatic lands, foster water-dependent uses, um, ensure environmental protection, and to utilize renewable resources. And then we're consistent with those four to generate revenue for the state. Uh, the revenue um, gained by the use of state-owned aquatic lands is uh, then reinvested to manage um, and restore Washington uh, aquatic e ecosystems. Um, <clears throat> Go to the next slide. Uh, DNR's, DNR's Aquatic Resources Division is uh, tasked with managing state-owned aquatic lands and implementing these uh, management guidelines. Uh, there's a variety of interdependent um, programs involved in the management um, with the goal to ensure a net benefit for the citizens of Washington. One of the fundamental aspects of the Aquatic Resources Division is its leasing program, which uh, includes aquaculture leasing. And land managers work with the applicants and tenants to uh, where appropriate issue leases for, for the use of those lands. And in a minute, I'll speak more to that. Tied to our leasing program is our stewardship program, whose responsibility is, is it to ensure um, environmental protection of those aquatic lands, uh, and I'll go into that a little deeper. Another major component um, is um, of the Aquatic Resources Division is our science team, uh, which in a nutshell uh, helps to ensure long-term sustainability and resilience of aquatic lands through um, science-based conservation and restoration activities. Um, and that includes understanding long-term distribution and trends of critical habitat, including kelp, and um, advising on how to ensure continued health of that into the future. So I'll speak a little bit more to that in another slide as well. Aquatic Resources in managing state-owned aquatic lands does a myriad of other things. Um, uh, aquatic restoration, um, we have aquatic reserves throughout the state. We remove derelict vessels. We have, a, as mentioned, we have a large wild stock gooey duck fishery and we get involved in shellfish management and other things. A DNR aquatic land lease is the instrument in which DNR uses to approve a seaweed aquaculture farm. Uh, and there's numerous steps involved uh, and required through that process, which I'll go into here. Um, please don't mistake the brevity in which uh, I'm touching on this as a, as a simplicity in the process. Uh, it's actually a little bit involved and somewhat complex and can take some time, as many of you are learning. Um, procedurally, the DNR leasing program starts with the uh, Joint Aquatic Resources Permit Application, or the JARPA. Uh, for those not familiar with that, you can refer to the uh, Governor's Office of Regulatory uh, Innovation and Assistance Program for details. Or just Google JARPA. Uh, when the DNR land management staff receive a, a JARPA application, their first step is to evaluate and review the proposal. So that includes confirming whether the project is on state-owned aquatic lands. Uh, it probably will be because uh, we manage most of the bedlands throughout the state. But if, if not, then uh, you wouldn't need to um, work with DNR any longer. As I said, we're a property manager. Um, we, if it's on state-owned aquatic land, uh, we, we look, about, look at other uses and preference rights and other potential encumbrances to see if it would be available for leasing. The JARPA also triggers um, many of the other state and local and federal permit processes that will be required um, as part of the process for uh, getting approval for a seaweed aquaculture farm. Um, so we go through, uh, it looks like I have five minutes. I'll try to hurry a little bit further. Three minutes, okay. Um, 
Other things that are required are a land survey. We negotiate and issue a lease, and then that becomes a kind of a long-term relationship. Um, and there's a term on that lease. Um, aquatic land leases uh, cover specific items. Um, it outlines the specific property uh, that authorizes a specific use over a specific term, and it costs a certain amount of rent. The tenant takes on a responsibility to manage and maintain the improvements and care for the land, um, and it captures um, uh, all the um, plan of operations and the stewardship measures. Uh, this slide provides an overview of our stewardship program. Um, there, um, which our stewardship staff are embedded in our leasing program to make recommendations on how to uh, care for and um, take care of the land for our leases. Um, this uh, covers standard things like overwater structures, um, buffers um, on um, that sort of thing. Uh, it um, provides measures to reduce con compaction of sediments and other impacts uh, to the environment. Seaweed aquaculture as a nascent and emerging uh, use but raises unique questions that we're working through. Um, and uh, we're working through many of these questions and evaluating what measures may be needed to incorporate into seaweed aquaculture leases. And so we're working on that now with many of our um, current applicants. Two more slides here. So in addition to um, um, stewardship and land management, a big area that we work on is aquatic science. Um, the, our science program helps guide our stewardship and land management decisions. Um, they're um, also involved in um, other exciting things. We heard earlier today about the kelp conservation and recovery plan that DNR worked with the Northwest States uh, Initiative and others to develop in 2020. Um, recently, um, we, um, you know, in response to dramatic loss of kelp and eelgrass throughout Washington State, the legislature passed Senate Bill 5619, which directed DNR to create um, the kelp forest and eelgrass meadow health and conservation plan. So the goal of that plan is to conserve and restore at least 10,000 acres of kelp and eelgrass by uh, 2040. So DNR is currently developing that plan through a collaborative planning process. Um, and um, that um, there's an engagement plan being developed. In fact, um, I was asked to mention that uh, there's, we're soliciting members for a working group. Um, that is, uh, a deadline is tomorrow. So that's on our website. <laughs> um, good timing here. So if you're interested, you can go to the website uh, shown here. Um, and then I'll just end with this slide, which shows the locations of the commercial seaweed aquaculture farm applications, the current applications we have in Washington right now. Uh, DNR is currently working with a handful of applicants at various stages in the permitting and lease process. Uh, in addition, we're getting frequent calls from other interested businesses wishing to find out more about the leasing process. So um, we're expected to see uh, additional applications, and I know some of you are here today. Um, if you haven't been in contact with us already, please reach out to us. Um, we have two aquaculture land managers, Jillian Greenwoods, who's here today. You can raise your hand. She covers the Puget Sound area, um, and her contact information is here. And then Natalie Solly is uh, the coastal um, aquatic land manager for aquaculture for DNR. So with that, I'll stop and um, we can take questions, I think. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. I don't think we have time for questions. I'm so sorry, although maybe you can chat in the hallway. Um, yeah, the DNR, I thought I had a deadline with this conference, um, but uh, they had a big deadline just last week, and then uh, to to reach a milestone in this kelp conservation recovery planning process and then uh, to be ready to go with the engagement. Um, they're not even going to get a break. They're going to keep going. So I think what I'm supposed to do right now is, oh, 
Whatever I did, it worked, or Terry did it, and I just feel good about it. <laughs> Do I need to mute or anything? Just get out of the way. Welcome, Claire, from Zoomland. Please, uh, we're glad you're here. Will you please introduce yourself when you're ready? Hi. Um, sorry, I'm trying to share the screen at the moment here. Um, having a few little glitches. Nope, I think it's there, and I'm just going to make this big. I won't be able to see the chat um, after this, so please just barge in if there's questions. Um, my name is Claire Ryan. I'm a professor at the University of Washington College of the Environment School of Environmental and Forest Sciences, and I teach and do research in the area of natural resource policy, conflict management, um, in another life. I worked at the Department of Ecology and the Environmental Pro Protection Agency, all in the water area. So it's kind of nice to be doing some water related work. Um, I'll be talking about um, a project that uh, was funded by Sea Grant several years ago regarding gooey duck aquaculture and also just providing some general insights into natural resource conflicts, um, decision making, those kinds of things. Um, so Again, one of my primary areas of research is related to understanding natural resource conflicts, processes for managing those conflicts, and I know all of you have experienced and been part of conflicts in different dimensions of your lives. Um, I've looked at a lot of different conflicts and different decisions relating to natural resource uses, and we see these arise in all kinds of areas. Uh, some examples are fees to use federal lands, uh, preserving habitat for endangered species, siting solar projects in agricultural areas, uh, forest practices, and of course, aquaculture. Um, when we, we, this is boiling down a lot of research, but when, when we're anticipating or responding to conflict, often we see responses responses that include kind of just impasse, you know, no action, no decision, nothing happens. Uh, we try to avoid it, we might ignore it. Uh, a lot of the issues I look at, I, I, I look at and examine different appeals, challenges, litigation. Um, those are lots of the responses that kind of try to influence how that decision is made. I also do a lot of research on collaborative approaches. And so I've been listening when I can today. It's our last week of classes, so it's a little bit crazy, but it's been nice to see that collaborative approaches are, are mentioned and seem to be happening in terms of seaweed aquaculture. And again, these are just processes that are in addition to kind of traditional administrative processes where you have broad participation, information sharing, and you know the goal of adaptive governments governance, adaptive management. So the project I was involved in back in 2016 was funded by Sea Grant. Um, we conducted a situation assessment. I worked with a team of uh, grad students at the School of Marine and Environmental Affairs. And basically that situation assessment, it sounds like one is happening for this issue as well, which is great to hear. Um, really interviewed a broad network of interested parties. And so gooey duck is not as similar to seaweed aquaculture, although there are some similarities. It does occur on the shoreline. And so there's definitely some different kinds of concerns with gooey duck than perhaps there might be with seaweed, but there's, there's maybe some lessons to be learned here. Um, and this session was titled Public Perceptions, but really we assessed all perceptions. It was not just public. So it's, it's very important to kind of understand all perspectives about the, the issues and what are the concerns. Um, so we looked at, we did some interviews and then we also analyzed um, challenges and appeals of hearings board decisions. So quickly, some of these issues that were identified through interviews, I have a paper that you can get. I've got a citation to that at the end. Um, probably not so surprising, right? We see issues with aesthetics, um, visual impacts, light, noise, 
uh, recreation and access to shorelines. Um, I guess the other thing that makes this issue slightly different, although Brady just mentioned a lot about leasing public lands, this was very much focused on and in response to uh, DNR's proposal to lease public shorelines for gooey duck aquaculture. Um, but certainly some concerns about public shorelines being used for kind of commercial or private purposes, private um, gain, um, access, you know, getting boats up, just walking on the shoreline, navigation hazards, um, large, another category of, of land use concerns um, in, certain, in terms of whether these public shorelines might be rezoned for commercial use, many of those shorelines abut um, private property. Um, sorry, Terry, I'm just seeing this chat. You're saying, could you share your slides? Are you not able to see the presentation or? No, you're, you're good, Claire. We can see everything. Okay. I thought you said share the slides in the notes. So that was, I, I wouldn't even look at the chat probably if I okay, were <laughs> ignore I the thought. chat. <laughs> sorry. Usually I don't see the chat because my screen is so small. Um, another big category of concerns was ecological impacts, uh, marine debris, water quality, eelgrass impacts, uh, just the reliability and trust of information. Um, Another category, again, there's, these are probably not surprising. Uh, we just heard about some of the permitting challenges. I second that it's not a simple or easy process. Um, some concerns that there's support for the industry, which is embedded in state policy, right? So there's, there's kind of a lot of confusion about that, that, that that was something that had support at the state level. Um, and then several questions about using, you know, kind of if public lands are used in this way, what are some of the potential benefits to the state and, and just a lot of um, concern that some of the profits from Guidoc aquaculture in particular might not stay in the state. They would go overseas or elsewhere. Um, also some concern about the quality and quantity of jobs. So lots of different perspectives and we interviewed People representing landowners who had gooey duck near them, who did not have gooey duck near them. We interviewed academics, we interviewed tribal members, we interviewed uh, aquaculture farmers. Um, that's probably most of the categories. So we kind of did a very broad set of interviews. Um, when we identified, when we looked at the appeals of hearings boards, so these permits, um, many of them were granted at the county level and then they go up through the state process and often ended up at the um, Shorelines Hearings Board. Again, we saw lots of issues related to um, aesthetics, recreation, impacts. And this other issue was restrictions on aquaculture. So we found uh, something like nine or ten challenges that we looked at. There weren't a ton. Five of those appeals were from growers. And so Kind of just a note to make no assumptions about who might raise concerns with these activities. Um, there was several appeals from growers who were kind of appealing certain restrictions on their activities. Other appellants might have been citizen, might have been a state agency with a citizen, um, raised other concerns similar to those ones we heard about in our interviews. And the, the resolution of those appeals, basically, um, the hearings board sticks very close to state law. And many of those were resolved through um, ordering, you know, site specific best management practices. And, and the hearings board relied heavily on this environmental code of practice of the Pacific Coast Shellfish, Shellfish Growers Association. Um, and, and basically kind of came to the conclusion that maybe we can adjust the best practices in this permit and then move forward. Um, many of the concerns kind of didn't reach this bar of what we what they call burden of proof. So if you say, well, it has an impact on X, the hearings board wants to see information, credible information that shows that there is in fact an impact. So part of that is due to this 
lack of information at the time about some of the impacts. And, and of all these appeals, uh, none of the permits were rescinded, but some of them were modified to implement more best management practices. Um, so they really stick close to state law, they stick close to Shoreline Management Act and Shoreline Master Plans. And that's really kind of the, the policy um, background that they, they relied on. So a couple of potential lessons um, that might be relevant, and some of these I've, I've heard, uh, you know, that you've, you're on the track here already talking about these issues. And certainly this idea of best management practices, um, in some cases, maybe seaweed, they need to be more developed. But in, even in gooey duck aquaculture, there was a desire to make those practices more widely available and incorporate those into farm plans. Um, also have part of those practices be broader and better communication about the intentions and about the practices. Uh, so there's a number of things that are relevant in terms of thinking about best practices that can be developed through these partnerships or through these working groups that, that I just heard about. A uh, big uh, issue also is uh, information and knowledge. There was a lack of information, and I think I've heard there's some lack of information in this realm as well. Sometimes a distrust of science and this idea of best available scientific information, a little bit of, of um, concern about kind of how do we incorporate other forms of knowledge, not just Western science, and if there's ways to do that in this seaweed context, um, that, that will really help. And I think symposiums like this are a great first start uh, to kind of share information and what do we know and what do we don't know and kind of be upfront about that. I think the other big lesson is this idea of policy context, um, understanding your operating environment. And we just heard from Brady a lot about that operating environment um, in terms of permits and rules and what are the county, the state, the federal policies and plans that are governing what's happening um, in for this activity? And then how, how are the co-managers involved? And, and in Gooey Duck Aquaculture, it was less kind of brought up a little less often, although tribes certainly brought that up and just kind of really being aware of that. And we kind of focus a lot on the science and that's very important. But that policy context and that operating environment, I would argue, is just as important as how much we know or we don't know. Um, I guess the one lesson that I pulled out, I haven't tracked this lately. Brady, I'm sure, and others at DNR know a little bit more. Um, this gooey duck aquaculture proposal for leasing state lands kind of blew up in a bunch of public meetings. And there was you know, lawsuits and challenges and just a lot of anger. Um, DNR started a pilot leasing project, which incorporated elements that address some of these concerns, research and monitoring, what are some of the physical criteria for where these activities can take place on state lands, um, requirements for those who want to do, to want to lease, um, to really address some of these management and outreach criteria that would, would get at some of these issues about access, about debris, about visual impacts and just about communication. And so I haven't tracked kind of where that pilot program is, but I know that was starting a couple years after we, it was earlier actually, but the, that pilot program, um, knowing this information and kind of understanding these perspectives can really help you develop a pilot program that, that can address and anticipate some of these, these issues. Um, so this is kind of in the idea, the pilot is, is in this idea of being adaptive, right? Let's try something, let's learn, let's adapt. Um, so some of these are, are things that occurred in the gooey duck um, situation, and there's a lot more that could be said. Um, but I'll just mention one other additional um, item here, if I can move my slides, which have stopped moving, they haven't. Uh, coming soon, there's a Sea Grant capstone project this next year, Perceptions of Seaweed Aquaculture. So Nicole Wentworth might be there today. She's working with Sea Grant. I'm helping her think about interviews, and uh, she may end up contacting 
some of you for interviews about your perceptions of seaweed aquaculture. Um, just thank Sea Grant, the Gooey Duck Study collaborators, and then a link to that article that really looked more deeply at, uh, pun intended, uh, the, the specifically the Gooey Duck aquaculture conflict. And I will send my slides in so those are available. But I'd be happy to answer questions or I can't see, but I can, I think I can see the chat now. This is Zoom teaching. We've been doing this for the last two and a half years. You can uh, probably hear us. I'm not, uh, first let's clap. <laughs> Yay. Yeah. 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 Four people that are left in the room, right? Thank How about you. if I stop sharing? Does that help? Yeah. That works. Again, I, I'm not sure how we'll do this. We haven't been, this isn't a Zoom webinar, so we haven't been using the chat to communicate with speakers. So we have That's been fine. having just, yeah. people come up to the mic. And what I'm thinking, your talk, Claire, which was wonderful, and uh, I wrote down all sorts of ideas, um, ties in so well with Brady and Chris's presentations. Um, maybe we don't have a lot of time. We have less than five minutes, but if people want to come up to the mics and ask questions of any of our three prior speakers, if, if they're still here. There's one. <laughs> and the, um, that would be fine. Um, and you could, maybe there would be a question and everyone could respond. Um, so I'll let, see if there's questions from the audience first. If not, I can prompt one, but does anybody? These people have been here, they're, they're tireder than I am. <laughs> so you have the wonderful uh, honor, Claire, of being very last. Here comes Tom. I did promise he could ask a question at the end of the agencies. <laughs> this is Tom Bumper. Tom, you didn't, you didn't speak exactly directly to this, but how do you feel the importance of local community? You mentioned as social justice or Tom. trust building in all Tom. this. Could you hear Tom from that mic? Why don't you come up here, Tom? You can ask up here. Okay. No hot mics around here. Um, <laughs> this is Tom Mumford. Question was, how do you feel that social justice is one of the terms that's been used? And sort of, I'm going to call it trust building, fits into all this that you've been talking about. Is that for me? Yeah. And it could yeah, be for um, the other people that have yeah. been... I think, I mean, that's key because these collaborative or partnerships, kind of a broader involvement in understanding what we know, what decisions are going to be made, that can build trust. And in many cases that I've studied, it has built trust where parties were very much polarized. It does take time. It's not something you do in one or two meetings. It's something that is a long-term kind of relationship building um, process. And the ones that we've seen that, that build the most trust are processes where agency or decision makers actually make a firm commitment to actually using the feedback, the suggestions that are legal, right? <laughs> um, but you know, not just having a meeting and saying, thank you for your input, and then we'll go make our plan anyway, but really a, 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 a true accepting of feedback and incorporating those ideas and incorporating different forms of knowledge. So I think it's, it's a key way to help break down some of those barriers between multiple organizations that have an interest in the activity. Uh, would Chris or Brady like to respond to Claire? Or she also just kind of left me with a perfect closing um, concept. So. Chris, yep, okay. Um, so Claire, this is Meg, and I'm, thank you so much for really tying uh, together um, so many of the concepts that we uh, talked over today. And I'm thinking you've given us all a very clear direction for where to head. Um, the lessons that you drew from gooey duck aquaculture and the various, um, very specific suggestions for how to build collaborative relationships and uh, steer clear of conflict or minimize um, conflict when there, possible. There will be conflict. There will be conflict. Plan on it. <laughs> OK. 
Okay. That's what I tell my students. But there can be good conflict. Anyone who's ever been to like yeah. marriage counseling knows that there's bad conflict and good conflict. So we can do this. Um, and I want to I want to say that uh, not only can this you know, watch out, because last time we had a meeting like this and there were just a bunch of people who showed up in the room together at the be beginning of the day, by the end of the day, they ended up forming a thing. And then, you know, a collaborative and, and community of practice. And while I don't think we need to invent the real, because we do have now the Washington Seaweed Collaborative, and you, those of you who don't know what it is, I promise to uh, make that more uh, clear and you're all invited. And um, it can be this community that Claire was just describing where people can talk to each other and try out ideas in a s safe space. Uh, you know, these things don't need to be uh, litigated. They don't need to be argued in a very charged environment. And um, Washington Sea Grant is always happy to support uh, people coming together for constructive conversations like we've started to have today. And so um, uh, I'll just volunteer that the Seaweed Collaborative will be along, around as long as we can continue to support it. Um, and we'll try very hard to find that. We get good support in these efforts from our partners at the Nature Conservancy and the Restoration Fund. Um, and um, I cannot believe I'm saying this, but this may not be the last seaweed, Washington Seaweed Knowledge Symposium. <laughs> it could happen again. You all ask for it. I need a, I need a little vacation. Don't, don't ask me on Monday. Ask me in January when, <laughs> when it's all a rosy memory, but thank you. Um, speaking of thank yous, uh, before I can all the speakers, everyone who contributed. I am just so incredibly grateful to you. Um, you. If you've ever planned anything like this, you know the anxiety that the, that the organizer feel, feels about, they're not gonna come, they're gonna cancel, and people won't come, and then you all came and you spoke, and it was wonderful. So I am so grateful, and I am gonna sleep well tonight as a result, and I'm looking forward to it. I would like to, um, of course, say a thank you to our host venue here, to St. Martin's team, who had everything ready for us when we raced in here, like 20 minutes before you all got here. And the tech worked, and the food was wonderful. Thank you to Bon Appetit Catering. And um, so Jeff and David in the facilities are the ones who worked the magic that you see. And Tasmia and crew made our wonderful lunch, and we're very grateful for that. And a big thank you in the back to Deirdre Allen of Mason Web TV uh, for filming this whole thing and streaming it. And you won't have to wait till January for um, the edited, well, you will have to wait till January for the edited movie, but if you wanna just watch the raw footage tonight, sounds like you can go to masonwebtv.com YouTube channel and you can skip the lunch part, it'll only take six and a half hours. <laughs> so share with your families. And I just want to say thank you to my seaweed team. The, oh. <laughs> I'm really tired, so that's <laughs> getting weepy. But the seaweed, the seaweed sisters are wonderful. And the seaweed cousins, the seaweed cousins are also in the back of the room. Everyone at Washington Sea Grant who has held me up. Thank you. So, I'm, I'm happier than I look. Don't worry about me. <laughs> All right, be safe. There's no point in going to sit in traffic if you want to go find some new friends or old friends and go enjoy a beverage and some food somewhere and talk more about seaweed. Um, I encourage you to do so. I regret that we will have to race out of here um, and get cleaned up, but be safe on your way home, and thank you again for coming. Okay. Thank you, Mary. Okay.